R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 4, Chapter 16 through 20. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI neural voice. Chapter 16, My Boys. One day that September, 1866, while General Lee was riding out on the road to the Rockbridge Baths, he stopped at a roadside spring. He found some young men there who recognized him instantly, handed him a drink of water, and then told him about themselves. They were from Tennessee, they explained, and were prospective students at Washington College. Might they give him their introductions from General Ewell and others of his former officers? Lee read the letters, how often, and in scenes how different had he opened messages from Ewell, and inquired of the boys whither they were bound. To Rockbridge Baths, they said, to spend part of the time before the opening of college. Lee forthwith wrote and delivered them a line to the operator of the springs, John A. Harmon. My dear Major, it read, these are some of my new boys. Please take care of them. That note did more than win for the Tennesseans the most cordial of welcomes at the baths, it displayed as well the spirit in which General Lee regarded the students of Washington College. He held them as his boys in his labor with them and in his hopes for them. His boys, they were in the disciplinary system he had developed to such an extent by the beginning of his second session that its details may now be reviewed. His boys were not all boys. In fact he never called them boys to their faces. In private conversation as in official dealings, each of them was Mr. Many of them were veterans of his own campaigns and wore beards. A few of them were reckless and violent, hardened by their experience in war and loose in their habits. College to them was a minor adventure, endurable only because it offered opportunities for wassailing in the bars of the town and for hunting the defiant fox in the hills around Lexington. Other ex-soldiers, serious-minded, were typified by a young man who tramped all the way to the campus from Alabama, bringing with him his father's gold watch and $300, all the family could raise for his schooling. These students worked with a zeal that set a standard for the college, and as they had obeyed General Lee's orders during the war, they cheerfully submitted themselves to his discipline now. They were indifferent to dress, had no money to waste, and were anxious to equip themselves as rapidly as possible for their careers. The third group consisted of boys who were just coming of the age to enter college and had not seen service in the army, yearlings they were styled by the veterans. Sons of rich men and of poor, they differed little, except in preparation, from those who crowd the registrar's offices today. Some of them had been spoiled at home and were sent to Lexington in the belief that the discipline and influence of General Lee would undo parental mistakes. For the well-being of a student body so diversified and so difficult to handle, General Lee felt an obligation that sometimes weighted him down. Especially when he saw them together, in assembly, did their care hang heavily on him. Coming out of chapel one morning he was seen to be so much affected that he was asked if anything was wrong. I was thinking, he answered simply, of my responsibility to Almighty God for these hundreds of young men. He was mindful of every one of them, as will presently appear, but doubtless in his heart he was most moved by the struggles of his former soldiers and by the persistence of those who bore the shackles of poverty. Yet he would not permit his veterans to lament the years during which they had worn the southern uniform. A favorite and brilliant pupil he called to him one day and cautioned against overwork. The student defended himself. I am so impatient, said he, to make up for the time I lost in the army. Lee flushed instantly. Mr. Humphreys, he exclaimed in a tone but one pitch removed from anger, however long you live and whatever you accomplish, you will find that the time you spent in the Confederate Army was the most profitably spent portion of your life. Never again speak of having lost time in the Army. So far as he could, he helped these former soldiers and the poorer students. To Humphreys he awarded a scholarship the donor had left to his nomination, and in Humphreys's interest he wrote a commendatory letter which that student, later a savant of distinction, cherished to the day of his death. Lee almost wept when the boy who had covered the long road from Alabama told him of his hopes and ambitions, and he arranged it that the stout-hearted youth should board cheaply in the country and should have employment, though it was only as a farm laborer, during the long vacation. 
he discovered that another lad from the far south, who was residing in the country to save expense, had no place to study between classes. Making a place for the boy in his office, he insisted that he work there, and when he missed him one day, he rode out to see if his young companion was sick. By diligent correspondence, he solicited work in summer for boys who needed money with which to complete their college course. Regarding an engineering student who sought a temporary position, he wrote the president of the James River and Kanaw Canal Company, he is a very promising young man, of great energy and integrity of character and is willing to take any position in which he can make himself useful and earn his subsistence for the time. You may probably have known his father Colonel Angus MacDonald, who died during the war and left a widow and seven children, of whom H is the eldest, six others are to be educated. Some students who could not get summer work or raise money among their friends were accepted, as already recorded, on credit, evidenced solely by their notes of hand. General Lee initiated the honor system very soon after he came to Lexington and made it the basis on which all students were received. Faculty visitation of dormitories and all forms of espionage were abolished. If any breach of discipline occurred or any injury was done to college property, he expected the students who were involved in it to report to him. We have no printed rules, Lee told a new matriculate who asked for a copy. We have but one rule here, and it is that every student must be a gentleman. The first and the final appeal was to the student's sense of honor. As a general principle, he told a young professor, you should not force young men to do their duty, but let them do it voluntarily and thereby develop their characters. The great mistake of my life was taking a military education. The code of the college, as Lee developed it, was positive though unprinted. The regulations, though few, were always enforced. Make no needless rules, he admonished the faculty. And again, we must never make a rule that we cannot enforce. Except in a few particulars, he did not attempt any compromise with the system he had inherited at West Point and had employed there. He turned away from it altogether, with the explanation that he was not training men for the army but for civil life. The discipline fitted to make men soldiers was not the best to qualify men for the duties of citizenship or for success in life. For many years, said he, I have observed the failure in business pursuits of men who have resigned from the army. It is very rare that any one of them has achieved success. He may even have gone so far as to emphasize by his own movements in the company of military men that he was no longer a soldier and was not disciplining cadets. It was noticed in Lexington that on occasions when the faculty and students of Washington College appeared with the staff and corps of the Virginia Military Institute, General Lee never marched in time with the drumbeat or kept step with the head of the other school. But though he put all the past behind him and administered the college as if he had never exercised authority as a commanding general in the field, he drew a clear and constant distinction between military rule and self-controlled obedience to constituted authority. One of his oft-repeated maxims was, obedience to lawful authority is the foundation of manly character. The first application of the great fundamental, be a gentleman, was to the student's habits of study. The general countenanced no idleness. Even under the elective system, all students had to take at least 15 hours of classroom work each week, and every man was required to belong to one or the other of the two literary societies. Although he was himself believed to prefer mathematics, Lee urged no particular courses on the boys, but he insisted that they attend regularly the classes in which they were registered. General holidays were few. At Christmas, the men got only one day's intermission, or at most two. When the students threatened to cut classes because Lee would not allow them a long Christmas recess, he calmly warned them he would close the college if they did so. In partial compensation, the length of the session was reduced to a flat nine months. All requests for leaves of absence, even for a day, had to be passed upon personally by the president. He knew that the presence of most of the students represented someone's sacrifice in those difficult times, and he was determined that students should not waste what others had sweated to provide. A Georgia student absented himself from classes in order to share in the fine skating that a long and heavy freeze on North River afforded. Very soon there came a summons to the president's office. Mr. said Lee in kindly tones, I notice you have been absent for a number of recitations. Yes, sir, the boy answered truthfully, I was skating on North River. 
Mister, if you had asked for permission to go skating, your work is very good, and I would have given you permission with pleasure. And now, mister, you know our southern people are very poor, and to send you to college, your parents must be forced to economize and deprive themselves of many things. The boy choked up. Stop, General Lee, he said, you will never see me in your office again. And thereafter, to the end of General's life, that student gave no cause for complaint. One reminder of his parents' sacrifices was enough. A new matriculate from Confederate disdained both books and class attendance for his first month in college. When the reports came in, Lee sent for the boy and went over all his grades, asking if a mistake had been made in recording them. The student admitted that his marks were as good as he deserved. He had no excuse to make for his absences from class. Lee happened to be acquainted with the boy's parents and explained that he knew so poor a report would cause them great sorrow. If, again, the report was printed in the catalog, it would humiliate them. I do not know what to do, he said, and sat for a moment. Then, without another word, he quietly tore up the paper. The boy broke down and wept and, after a few words from Lee, promised to do his utmost. He redeemed his pledge in every particular. As with these two young men, so with many. In their awe of him, and in their affection of him, students rarely neglected the study they knew he valued so greatly. The standard of attainment at the college went higher and higher. Both from faculty and from students, the best was elicited. Lee's second application of the code of a gentleman was to the general deportment of the students. Unostentatiously and with few preachments, but hourly and earnestly, Lee sought the elevation of the boys' morals rather than the mere repression of vice, in the words of one of the members of his faculty. At the same time, he waged active war on liquor. One day, while he was walking in Lexington, he saw a young man stagger from a bar room, and he fired up instantly. I wish, he said to his companion, that these military gentlemen, while they are doing so many things which they have no right to do, would close up all of these grog shops, which are luring our young men to destruction. He had seen too much of the ill effects of alcohol in the army not to make him regard it as a dangerous enemy. My experience through life, he wrote a temperance society among the students, has convinced me that, while moderation and temperance in all things are commendable and beneficial, abstinence from spirituous liquors is the best safeguard of morals and health. There was little hard drinking among the majority of the students, but those who fell deeply into their cups were expelled from the college. Lee was meticulous, however, in his insistence that guilt be beyond doubt. In one case, all the faculty were for sending a student home for frequenting barrooms and getting drunk. Have any of you seen this young man intoxicated? Lee asked. Nobody had. Have any of you seen him entering barrooms? None of them could affirm it. We must be very careful how we are influenced by hearsay, the general concluded, in substance. During the war at a time when my physical and mental strain was intense, I was reported to the executive as being habitually intoxicated and unfit for the discharge of my duties. More than one boy who slipped into imprudent drinking probably had much the same experience as the lad who was summoned to the president's office after the general had seen him a bit uncertain on his legs in the street. Mr. said Lee, when the student appeared, I had occasion to write to your mother some time ago and it gave me great pleasure to tell her how well you were getting along in college. The young man, thrown off his guard, could only answer rhetorically, I trust one may ever live worthy of your commendation. Looking squarely at him, Lee went on, Mr., did it ever occur to you that when you reach middle life, you may need a stimulant, and if you have accustomed yourself to taking stimulants in your early life it will require so much more to have the desired effect at a time when you may need it? How much better it would be, the general concluded, if the young man would leave intoxicants in his student days. The boy did. Good habits of worship Lee ranked with those of study and of general deportment. Compulsory chapel attendance he abolished at the close of his first year at the college, but he was always anxious that the students should be present and he sought various ways of assuring this. He was always at chapel himself, sitting in the same place, next the wall on the north side of the new building, in the second pew from the front. The college YMCA, which he did much to organize, always had his encouragement, his contribution, and his praise in his annual report. 
he invited the ministers of the town to act in turn as chaplain and jointly to meet the students at the opening of the session. Painstakingly he prepared and sent each Lexington pastor a list of the matriculates of his faith and he encouraged the clergymen to keep in touch with them. The general understood the ways of boys in church going, however, and he was not mystified when his old chief of artillery, General Pendleton, the Episcopal rector, complained that many of the collegians of that denomination were attending the Presbyterian church, drawn no doubt, the old gunner gamely admitted, by the eloquence of the minister, Dr. Pratt. As Lee well knew, Dr. Pratt had a very charming daughter, Grace, whom the young men of the dormitories much admired. So, when General Pendleton voiced his distress that Episcopal boys were flocking to the Church of the Presbyterian Orator, General Lee had the answer. I rather think, said he, that the attraction is not so much Dr. Pratt's eloquence as it is Dr. Pratt's grace. Although he jested about this with Dr. Pendleton and took care never to preach to the boys, General Lee was in nothing more serious than in his concern for their spiritual well-being. If I could only know that all the young men in the college were good Christians, he said on one occasion, I should have nothing more to desire. I dread the thought of any student going away from the college without becoming a sincere Christian. He was careful to place in Christian homes the boys who boarded in town, and he frowned on anything, excursions in particular, that interfered with their Sabbath day worship. To keep the peace was the last of the four simple requirements General Lee made of his boys in obedience to the first law of being a gentleman. Respect for good order meant something in the late 60s. For Lexington presented a field of more serious contention than the customary clashes between town and gown or between the college boys and the toothpicks as the students for some obscure reasons styled the local youths. The town had a federal garrison part of the time and was not always fortunate in the commander of the troops. To assist the Negroes, the Freedmen's Bureau was active. Agitators appeared frequently. Several times it seemed that issues were made by the military authorities simply to embarrass Lee. The students flashed with wrath whenever they thought that this was happening or that the general was being assailed. To protect him, they would balk at nothing. Lee, therefore, had constantly to keep the students in hand. In two instances, as will appear in course, matters grew serious. On all other occasions, Lee was able to forestall trouble. Sometimes he made formal written appeals to the students, as on a rather exciting day when word got around that a radical who was to address a political meeting that night intended to abuse General Lee. Students averred they would break up the gathering and made plans to do so. Hearing of this, the general summoned about a dozen of the student leaders to his office and told them he desired the college people to stay away from the meeting. Although it was then after three o'clock, his wishes were communicated quickly to all the boys, and none of them went. Occasionally, the students organized what they styled calathumps, which consisted of a march into the town and a tin pan serenade. If there was no particular reason why they should not do so, the general occasionally let the boys satisfy in this fashion the primal urge to make a noise. But when there was danger of a clash with the military, or when the sick were likely to be disturbed, or when the calathumps were designed to annoy some carpetbagger or scallywag, the general exercised a veto, mild but firm. Sometimes he posted a formal request, which the young men dubbed general orders. As often, he communicated with them through their own representatives. In every instance, it was sufficient for him to say that he did not want them to make a disturbance. His wish was their law. A monster calathumps, planned with enthusiasm, was unprotestingly abandoned when the president of one of the literary societies arose and announced, Gentlemen, nothing doing tonight, Moss Roberts says not. At his request, calathumps were completely abandoned in 1868. In administering this code of honor, General Lee was cognizant of the importance of what is now termed college spirit. It was the academic equivalent of the esprit de corps that had made the Army of Northern Virginia terrible in battle. The only approach he ever made to a speech at the college, except when he conducted the closing exercises of the session, had to do with this quality. It was one night at a joint meeting of the literary societies when he was standing on the floor, thronged by members. He told them then, briefly, that it was the duty of the students to do all in their power to add a claw to the exercises of the approaching commencement. 
These, then, were the things he required of his boys, that they be gentlemen in all things, that they study faithfully, that they hold to high moral standards, that they remember their Creator, and that they keep the peace. What he required of himself in his dealings with them was not so simple. He put his emphasis, first of all, on the individual. We must not respect persons, a professor once contended in the course of a faculty argument. Lee answered quickly, I always respect persons and care little for precedent. The weak or the inexperienced boy who was making an effort was always sure of his understanding sympathy. May I give you one piece of advice, sir, he said to one of his younger teachers. Well, sir, always observe the stage driver's rule. Always take care of the poor horses. When a boy came to college for the first time and entered his office to report, the general always rose to welcome him and greeted him with a graciousness that made the strange lad comfortable. He usually asked the newcomer what course of study he intended to follow, and though he never interfered with the matriculate's free election of his course, he sometimes would commend those who he thought had chosen wisely. In a few moments, the student had been bowed out. If he was young, he was usually sent to board at a selected private home in the town. The older boys lived in the dormitory. In either case, for months, the boy might not see General Lee again, except at chapel or on the walks. But he was not forgotten, and when he met the president, he was always addressed by name. For Lee always made it a point to identify every student. One boy came to the college from Baltimore, where he had been presented to the general at a reception, along with a host of others. As soon as he entered the general's office in Lexington, he was recognized by Lee and was greeted by name with a recountal of the circumstances of their previous meeting. At a faculty meeting, when the roster was being read to see that all the students were taking sufficient work, General Lee repeated a name, emphasizing each syllable as if he were trying to recall the individual. Then, half reproachfully, he exclaimed, I have no recollection of a student of the name, it is very strange that I have forgotten him. I thought I knew everyone in the college. How long has he been here? He pursued the question until he was convinced that he had never seen the boy, who was a newcomer and had entered the college during his absence. General Lee knew the men standing, too. He is a very quiet, orderly young man, he said one day to Collar who inquired about a student's progress, but seems very careful not to injure the health of his father's son. He got last month, he spoke without consulting the records, only 40 on his Greek, 35 on his mathematics, 47 on his Latin, and 50 on his English, which is a very low stand, as 100 is our maximum. Now, I do not want our young men to really injure their health, but I wish them to come as near it as possible. In another instance, he expressed regret, when a student's name was mentioned at a faculty meeting, that he has fallen back so far in his mathematics. The professor assured him he was mistaken, the boy was one of the best in his class. He got only 54 last month, Lee insisted. An appeal to the report proved him right. An error had been made in copying the student's standing. In both these cases, no doubt, Lee spoke with precision because he had the students on his mental list of those who needed special attention, but he always kept in mind the general level of a boy's performance. When the old-fashioned, all-day examinations were held, he would sit for an hour or two as the pupils wrestled with their questions. He judged results not by the number of new matriculates, but by the number of old students who returned. That, he said, is the measure of the success with which we have performed our duty. Even the more personal affairs of students were of concern to him. If they were extravagant in money matters he knew it. If their health was impaired, he investigated and counseled. The faculty met every week and reported those who were derelict. The general summoned them soon thereafter, through notes circulated by the college janitor, Lewis. At the end of each month, when fuller records of standing were filed by the professors, Lee put on the bulletin board a list of those whom he wished to see. In his office, alone, he received these delinquents, who usually were loath to discuss afterwards what happened between them and the general. The treatment probably was fitted to the patient, and usually it was administered in a few sentences, with a gentleness that impressed the student more than sternness would have done. Boys frequently came out in tears. Seldom did they have to go a second time into that drab room under the new chapel. 
Some of the things told them there might be maxims for the guidance of youth in every age. For a youngster who was in rebellion against authority, he put a life rule in a single sentence, you cannot be a true man until you learn to obey. Occasionally, very occasionally, some boy would carry his defiance with him into the president's office. Then an explosion might occur, as in the case of a Kentuckian who kept chewing tobacco during a disciplinary interview. Mr., said Lee, chewing is particularly obnoxious to me. Go out and remove that quid, and never appear before me again chewing tobacco. Shortly afterwards, the young man was before the president once more, and was chewing as vigorously as ever. Lee stopped for a moment and wrote a line or two on a sheet of paper. Then he turned quietly to the boy, Mr., here is a note for you. It will be posted on the college bulletin in ten minutes. The youngster, between chews, took the paper and read, Mr., is dismissed from Washington College for disrespect to the president. That was all. One who was in the school at the time observes, within three or four days the man went home, and during the interim of his remaining in Lexington, not a student would speak to him, and he left without a man of them going to see him off. Serious or persistent breaches were referred to General Lee by the faculty, or were brought up by him at the weekly meeting in order to get the professor's advice. The offender was interviewed and, if need be, his parent was notified. Here is a typical letter. Lexington, Virginia, December 12, 1867. My dear sir, I am glad to inform you that, has made more progress in his studies during the month of November than he did in October, and, as far as I can judge from the reports of his professors, he is fully capable of acquiring a sound education, provided he will faithfully apply himself. I am sorry, however, to state that he has been absent several times from his lectures in the month of November. Thirteen times he tells me he was prevented from attending by sickness, but five times, he says, he intentionally absented himself. He absented himself in the same way several times in October, and I then explained to him the necessity of punctual and regular attendance in his classes, which he promised to observe. I have again impressed upon him this necessity, and again he promises amendment, but I have thought it proper to write to you on the subject, that you might use your authority with him, for I have been obliged to give him to understand that, if this conduct is repeated, I shall be obliged to return him to you. Hoping I may be spared this necessity, I remain. With great respect, your obedient servant. R. E. Lee. All other expedients failing, the general would direct a student to withdraw. When this happened, reconsideration seldom followed, for a rule that Lee commended to his faculty was, never raise an issue which you are not prepared to maintain at all hazards. This form of withdrawal was accounted far less discreditable than expulsion, and was almost always accompanied by as sympathetic a letter to parent or guardian as General Lee felt the facts warranted. Under the circumstances, he wrote the father of one boy, the faculty deemed his longer connection with the college disadvantageous to him and not beneficial to the institution, and therefore required his withdrawal from college. I hope he may have reached home before you receive this, and that his experience here may be so far beneficial to him as to teach him the necessity of steady application and untiring industry in whatever he undertakes. To a parent who asked that his son be readmitted after he had been ordered to leave the school, he wrote, notwithstanding their sympathies for him, his youth and sense of error, the faculty, came to the resolution that they could not with propriety reverse their first decision without the risk of encouraging the other students to do the same thing under the expectation of like immunity, by which not only the lives of others, but of themselves, might be involved. He addressed this to a man in public life, it is with extreme regret that I inform you that it had become necessary for your son, Mr., to leave college. In consequence of his frank acknowledgement and written promise of future good behavior, his misconduct on a former occasion was overlooked by the faculty, and he was restored to his classes, but he has been unable to keep the pledge then given, and even if he could be permitted, he is unwilling to remain under the circumstances. I have therefore authorized him to return home and his connection with the college is dissolved. I hope this severe lesson will teach him the self-command he so much needs and enable him to refrain from a vice, which, if it becomes a habit, may prove his ruin. He is a youth of good capacity, candor, and truth. These qualities have endeared him to the members of the faculty, and I trust his future course will reinstate him in their good opinion and in the confidence of his comrades. 
In February, 1869, a lad got into some scrape and left college. His mother wrote to the general asking about the affair. He replied painstakingly and concluded, On the first arrival of your son at college I was agreeably impressed by his appearance and manners and was anxious that he should be favorably located. Until the occurrence which caused him to leave college, I had remarked nothing objectionable in his conduct but what might be attributed to youthful indiscretion and thoughtlessness and as one of these instances was calculated to teach him to what such conduct might reasonably lead, I was in hopes his own good sense would correct it. I however hope that this last occurrence will teach him a lesson that he will never forget and save him and you from any future distress. I hope that he has safely reached you before this and that his contrition and conduct will relieve you from further anxiety. Still again, in January, 1870, he had to write a minister that three protégés of his had decided to leave college. The rest of his letter so well illustrates his methods of dealing with the eternal problem of youth that it is worth quoting in extenso. Impressed by their appearance and manners and the high character they brought with them, I caused them to be introduced into the family of one of the most worthy gentlemen of the city, Mr. David E. Moore, where I hoped they would find many of the comforts of home, with the social and family influences to which they were accustomed. For the first two months of the session their progress was good, and attention to their lectures and studies regular, but during the latter part of December their attendance has been irregular and their studies have been neglected. I have from week to week during this time called their attention to the impropriety of this course, as far as the Messers, were concerned, and urged upon them the necessity of strict and regular attendance upon their classes. Mr. always gave indisposition as the reason for his absences, which of course I gave credit to. From facts that have come to the knowledge of the faculty, it is their opinion that the neglect of their studies by these young gentlemen, especially the Messers, has been caused by frequenting the public billiard room in Lexington where they have wasted much of their time and money the past month. The cause whatever it may be is much to be regretted for I had hoped that they would have derived all the benefits of the instruction of the college and have laid the foundation for a solid education. As I know the great interest you take in these young gentlemen and as you did me the kindness to give them a letter to me, I have thought I ought to make you the foregoing statement, lest you attribute their leaving college to graver causes. These were not easy letters to write or pleasant letters to receive. Answers to them were not always indited in a considerate spirit. The father of one boy who had been guilty of a serious violation of the college code provoked the general greatly by a long apology. Now it is evident to my mind, said Lee to a member of the faculty, that this is a disingenuous letter. He does not fairly represent the facts, and will completely ruin his son, as well as seriously interfere with our discipline. Now, sir, I will show you what I have written him in reply. It was a very keen, flawlessly polite rebuke, but the professor, who was acquainted with the man to whom the letter was addressed, knew that its point would be entirely lost on its recipient. He told General Lee so. The general was perplexed. Well, sir, he said at length, I cannot help it, if a gentleman can understand the language of a gentleman, he must remain in ignorance, for a gentleman cannot write in any other way. When students' shortcomings were not serious enough to justify expulsion, Lee occasionally suspended them. In such case it was his custom to exact a written pledge that the offensive conduct would not be repeated. In at least one instance, it seems that the giving of such a pledge and the lifting of the suspension were made a matter of collegiate record and probably were announced on the bulletin board. Further down the list were cases of indolence, of mistakes in courses, of discouragement, and of restlessness. All these General Lee handled personally. He conferred with every man who wanted to attend another school or quit college, with all those who desired to make changes in their classes, and even with those who sought temporary leaves of absence. The lazy lad he sometimes prodded with a spur of humor. How is your mother? he asked one boy. I am sure you must be devoted to her, you are so careful of the health of her son. The overconfident he tipped down quickly. This young man is going to graduate in one session, he said as he introduced a cocksure youngster to one of the professors. The boy expostulated, he had been misunderstood. He meant two years, not one. Ah, said the general, he has concluded to postpone it for a session. Well, sir, I wish you the full realization of your hopes, but I must tell you that you will have no time to play baseball. The student who failed in a final examination, he sometimes allowed another trial. 
those who got in trouble because of a prank that had no hurtful intent were sure of a merciful hearing. In the winter of 1866-1867, John M. Graham, a matriculate from Tennessee, found his supply of wood diminishing with rapidity. Suspecting that one of the Negro janitors was helping himself to the hickory, Graham loaded a stick with gunpowder and left it temptingly on the pile in his room. Next morning, the stove in Professor Joyne's classroom blew up, and the place was set afire. The flames were quickly put out and small damage was done, but there was a first-class sensation, for Joyne's insisted that the act was malicious. General Lee brought up the matter at chapel the following day and asked that any student who knew anything about the affair would report at his office that morning. Reasoning that the janitor had stolen his wood to feed Professor Joynes's fire rather than go through the snow to the college wood pile, Graham took a companion with him to bear him witness and went to see the general. He related his story and explained how he had set a trap for the thief. But, general, he had the wit to conclude, I didn't know it was Professor Joynes. Lee laughed. Well, Mr. Graham, your plan to find out who was taking your wood was a good one, but your powder charge was too heavy. Next time use less powder. There the matter ended. Another youngster, who absented himself too frequently from class, was called to give account of his wasted hours. Terror-stricken in the presence of the old chieftain, the boy stammered out something about an illness and then, realizing that he looked perfectly healthy, he started to tell about having left his boots at the shoemaker's. Stop, mister, stop, sir. One good reason is enough, said Lee. The student added, years later, in telling the story, I could not be mistaken about the twinkle in the old hero's eyes. Such calls to the general's office, whatever the outcome, were not relished. When a student emerged from the ordeal, his fellow collegians often asked, who said, good morning first, or, in other words, did the victim know when the general was through with him, 91. Lee did not wait until a boy was in trouble to counsel him. When a lad needed encouragement, he called him in. If a student had made a mistake of taste in a public speech and had abused the Yankees, Lee counseled him in moderation. Once a year he wrote to the parents of every boy who had done well a letter in which the student was commended, and at the end of the session he often added an autographed line of approbation to the student's final report. In addition, during the later years of his administration, he kept a list of distinguished undergraduates, one of the few echoes of West Point. The general did not mingle with the students, as a rule, but he made them feel that he had a personal interest in them. Meeting a small group of his boys in the street, he would omit none of them in his greeting. Whether in public or in private, his tone of voice in speaking to them was low, but his enunciation was so clear that every word was distinct. When students came to ask him to autograph pictures he did so cheerfully and without protest. Those who had bereavement at home were excused from classes without red tape. Many were received by his daughters in his home, though he firmly maneuvered to see that they respected the law of the parlor by leaving at ten o'clock. When students' parents came to Lexington, he always called on them, much to their satisfaction and vastly to the enlargement of the students' pride the timid boy he never overlooked. At commencement, in 1869, a stage carrying a group of students to the railroad stopped in front of the president's residence for one of the Mrs. Lee. While the vehicle was waiting, all except a retiring youngster piled out and went into the house to say goodbye to the general. He chatted with them a while, and then, learning there was one boy still on the stage, he went out and talked to him until the vehicle started. They felt his influence, did those boys of his, from the first time they went into his office to register. Although not actually afraid of him, they were most anxious not to offend him. Standing in awe of him, they yet had an exalted affection for him. Some of them thought they saw in his face the whole tragedy of the war, but the discerning knew he had kindness and humor of a kind. One student's sharpest recollection of the general was of the manner in which he laughed inwardly at a lecturer's jokes. Few as were the evidences of Lee's discipline, it was effective with the students. He had the power to bring out, wrote one of his boys, years after, and did bring out, the very best that there was in every student. No college in the land, asserted one of the ministers who served at the chapel, had a harder-working faculty or a better-behaved, more orderly set of students. 
said one of his professors, we doubt whether at any other college in the world so many young men could have been found as free from misconduct or marked by as high a tone of feeling and opinion as were the students of Washington College during these latter years of General Lee's life. Once, however, Lee met with defeat in his dealings with the students once they rebelled successfully. That was toward the end of the session of 18651866 when General Pendleton undertook on Friday afternoons to give a course in declamation. The students either resented having to take what they considered a class better suited to the preparatory school than to the college, or else they disliked the oratorical style of the old artillerist. In their first protest, they adroitly pinned papers to the tail of Pendleton's coat as he went up the aisle, applauded him noisily before he said anything, and then bombarded him with wads of paper. The general indignantly lectured them on bad manners and managed to finish the hour, but he complained to General Lee. At the next recitation, when Lee himself sat in the classroom, all, of course, was peaceful. But the following week, when Pendleton again essayed to face the boys alone, the members of the class enlisted some Confederates who stood outside the windows and yelled and blew horns. Then, when the minister refused to capitulate, someone threw into the room a dog with a tin can tied to his tail. The mad flight of the animal completed the chaos. General Pendleton denounced such rudeness and quit to come no more. For that one time, Lee was powerless, and all the influence he had built up did not avail to force the students to listen to Pendleton's discourses on how to recite Rienzi to the Romans, or Mark Anthony's oration, or Patrick Henry's cry, Give me liberty or give me death. It was never so in anything else, either while the boys were in college or thereafter. For Lee's influence over his students did not end when he handed them their degrees and declared them graduates of Washington College. It followed them and helped to shape their lives through the difficult years of poverty that preceded the South's recovery. To this day there remains a thinning company whose proudest boast is that its members were General Lee's boys at Lexington. They have not forgotten that he said of them, My only object is to endeavor to make them see their true interest, to teach them to labor diligently for their improvement, and to prepare themselves for the great work of life. And again, I have a self-imposed task, which I must accomplish. I have led the young men of the South in battle, I have seen many of them fall under my standard. I shall devote all my life now to training young men to do their duty in life. It was not easy to watch the welfare of nearly 400 boys, and it was not always pleasant to keep in hand all the small details and close economies of a poor, overcrowded college. The weight of his people's sorrow lay on his heart, all the while, and in his mind he sometimes had to do battle with many memories. He was sustained in it all by the self-mastery that was, in large sense, one expression of his religion. Belief in God's mercy and submission to His will, in a faith that never seemed to be troubled by doubt, were stronger after Appomattox, if that were possible, than before. There was little of the personal evangelist in his makeup. I find it so hard, said he, to keep one poor sinner's heart in the right way that it seems presumptuous to try to keep others, but he did speak of religion when he thought he could help, and he was deeply interested in religious revivals, such as that which swept the V.M.A. in May, 1869. He was not an ascetic. Discussing Lent, he said, the best way for most of us is to fast from our sins and to eat what is good for us. His sense of the practical showed itself in his religion, as in everything else. When a minister at chapel fell into the habit of praying so long that classes were delayed, Lee asked a member of the faculty, would it be wrong for me to suggest that he confine his morning prayers to us poor sinners at the college and pray for the Turks, the Jews, the Chinese, and the other heathen some other time? He believed in regular church attendance, and usually when his own church was open for service he was to be seen in his pew, the second from the pulpit and directly in front of the chancel. Always he knelt during the prayers, and loyally he listened to Dr. Pendleton's sermon. Sometimes attention was bought at a price. Under the gallery, perpendicular to the other seats, ran a long bench on which sat some of the McDonald boys, who were too numerous to get into the family pew that adjoined General Lee's. Often, during the rector's discourse, which was not among the briefest of human utterances, one or another of the MacDonald lads would go to sleep and would fall to the floor with a thud. It must have been very diverting to most of the congregation, which doubtless looked forward to it, but it never caused the general even to change expression. 
the general had family prayers every morning before breakfast, but his own spiritual life was bound up with the daily Bible reading and with special seasons of private devotions. The Bible was to him the book of books, a book, he wrote, which supplies the place of all others, and cannot be replaced by any other. He received various copies of the Bible, both for himself and for the college, but the one he used was a pocket edition he had carried with him in all his campaigning since he had been a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army. He was interested deeply in the work of Bible societies and served as president of the Rockbridge Organization. Even for the circulation of small religious newspapers he was willing to make a personal effort. Thus far it is easy to proceed in analyzing Lee's religion in after-war days. Beyond this it is not possible to go. Simple as was his soul, he had meat to eat that ye know not of. Chapter 17, Lee and the Reconstruction Acts the session of 18661867 opened on September 13 with a greatly increased registration. Before the end of March, the enrollment had risen to 345, and by commencement it was 399. Of these, only 139 matriculates came from Virginia. Tennessee sent 60, Kentucky 44, and Texas 33. Every southern state was represented. It was a very large student body for those pinching times. In comparison, the University of Virginia had 490 that year, the University of North Carolina, 128, Yale, 709, and Harvard, 961. The students were, also, perhaps a more serious company, in the main, than had come to Lexington the previous autumn. Except for some disturbances on the nights of November 2324, the behavior of the boys gave General Lee little concern until early spring. In caring for the fuller classes, the faculty was worked hard but was recruited during the winter. Colonel William Preston Johnston, son of General Albert Sidney Johnston, was named Professor of History and Literature to take his chair on February 1, 1867. Besides authorizing the appointment of an assistant professor of Latin and mathematics, the trustees relieved Lee of some of his duties by the choice of a young superintendent of grounds and buildings. However, there was enough outdoor duty, and to spare, because the trustees, at General Lee's instance, had put first among the construction projects of the college the erection of a new chapel. It was to cost not more than $10,000 when completed. As already explained, $6,000 might be spent at once if this would carry the work far enough to make the edifice serviceable. General Lee was most anxious to have a larger, more appropriate place of worship because of its anticipated influence on the spiritual life of the students. He devoted himself to building the structure economically and within the allowed appropriation. With Custis's assistance, he gave to it daily supervision and the experience gained in dealing with labor when he had been an army engineer. The slow progress of the construction and the straight limits of his available funds seemed only to make him more determined to complete it. He had personally selected the location for it, conspicuously opposite the line of older buildings on the hill, and he intended it to be the center of college life. Autumn slipped away and with the darker skies of winter came a gloomier outlook for Virginia and the rest of the South. Congress and the President had disagreed bitterly over Reconstruction. The committee that had heard General Lee and a host of witnesses had reported in April. On the basis of its findings, an elaborate plan was being built up to force the southern states to acquiesce in the enfranchisement of the Negroes as a condition of readmission to the Union. The government that had been functioning reasonably well in Virginia, its difficulties considered, was now threatened with overthrow. General Lee, of course, saw the trend of all this. In May, 1866, a short time after the committee made its report, he gave an interview to the young Marquis of Lorne, later the Ninth Duke of Argyle, who married Princess Louise, daughter of Queen Victoria. During their conversation, which was unrestrained, Lee displayed deep concern over the prospect. It would be long, he said, before there is any improvement in the condition of the people. The Radical Party are likely to do a great deal of harm, for we wish now for good feeling to grow up between North and South, and the President, Mr. Johnson, has been doing much to strengthen the feeling in favor of the Union among us. The relations between the Negroes and the Whites were friendly formerly, and would remain so if legislation be not passed in favor of the Blacks, in a way that will only do them harm. 
Li went on in a voice that Lauren thought very sorrowful, though there was not a touch of bitterness in it, we, they, do not seem to see that they are raising up feelings of race, and if a bad feeling is raised in consequence of unfair laws being passed against the weaker party it must yield. The blacks must always here be the weaker, the whites are so much stronger that there is no chance for the black, if the radical party passes the laws it wants against us. They are working as though they wish to keep alive by their proposals in Congress the bad blood in the South against the North. If left alone, the hostility which must be felt after such a war would rapidly decrease, but it may be continued by incessant provocation. The Southerners took up arms honestly, surely it is to be desired that the goodwill of our people be encouraged and that there should be no inciting them against the North. To the minds of the Southern men the idea of union was ridiculous when the states that made the union did not desire it to continue, but the North fought for the union, and now, if what appears to be the most powerful party among them is to have its own way, they are doing their best to destroy all real union. If they succeed, union can only be a mere name. The young Marquis, who had recently been in Washington, remarked that he had met many who approved of the president's course and would work for reconciliation. Yes, said Lee, but none seem to be courageous enough to oppose the radicals, who are therefore able to do what they like, and no one stands fairly up to them to hinder them. Surely if the Union be worth preserving, they should try to conciliate the whole nation and not do all they can against the southern part of it. In this, there was an echo of his statement before the Reconstruction Committee that it was good policy, in his opinion, for the North to conciliate the South. Lorne replied that he thought the great majority repudiated the extreme utterance of Thaddeus Stevens. He did not believe that the proposals of the Reconstruction Committee for confiscating Southern property and for disfranchising the whites would be acted upon favorably. Lee politely refrained from comment on this prophecy. As the debate in Congress and in the country progressed during 1866, Lee followed the newspapers with more care than usual and cut from them a number of articles that stated the Southern point of view in its historical bearings. These clippings he put away in a drawer of his table desk for future use. The scope and content of federal legislation were still undetermined in the early winter of 1866-1867, but it was manifest that the vindictive spirit of Thaddeus Stevens and his radical followers was triumphing over the wise policy of reconciliation that Lincoln had devised and Johnson sought to apply. Twenty months after Appomattox, the political prospect of the South was far gloomier than it had been at the time of the Amnesty Proclamation issued before the paroled Southern soldiers had all found their way home. These were the conditions in which General Lee received, during December, 1866, a letter from Sir John Dahlberg Acton, later Lord Acton. In this letter, the British historian asked for an expression of Lee's views on the constitutional issues involved in secession and on the longer political outlook in order that he might counsel wisely the editors of a new British review. General Lee took pains with his answer. Apparently, he procured from the library of one of the literary societies a volume on the American Constitution in order that he might speak by the book and he referred to several of the newspaper articles he had gathered during the year. He wrote his reply to Acton on December 15, 1866, but as the communication was not published at the time, the existence of the papers was not generally known until the appearance of Lord Acton's correspondence in 1917. Lee's letter, therefore, cannot be said to have had any appreciable influence on the South or on the determination of the questions with which it dealt, but it is very much the fullest expression of Lee's views and, when read with certain passages from some of his other correspondence, it shows clearly what he thought of the political prospect and how he viewed in retrospect the constitutional issue for which he had fought. It will be remembered that in 1861 Lee knew little about the constitutional involvements of secession. In one of his few known references to the subject, he confused the preamble of the Articles of Confederation with that of the Constitution of 1787. He went with Virginia on her secession because his whole background, his training, and his social and family ties led him to feel instinctively that his first allegiance, at a time of tragic but inescapable choice, was to her. He held that in her secession Virginia carried him with her. As he fought for the Southern cause, however, he came to see its meaning. Sacrifice clarified it. One cannot say when or how, whether it was by his own reading, or through the debates in winter quarters, or from the contagion of political belief, but Lee absorbed the Southern constitutional argument and was convinced by it. 
All that the South has ever desired, he wrote in January, 1866, was that the Union, as established by our forefathers, should be preserved, and that the government, as originally organized, should be administered in purity and truth. Speaking of his own course, he wrote, I had no other guide, nor had I any other object than the defense of those principles of American liberty upon which the constitutions of the several states were originally founded. To a friend in the West he wrote in 1869 what in 1866 undoubtedly was his opinion, I was not in favor of secession, and was opposed to war, in fact. I was for the Constitution and the Union established by our forefathers. No one now is more in favor of that Constitution and that Union, and, as far as I know, it is that for which the South has all along contended. In the fuller statement to Acton he now brought the state's rights argument to bear on the immediate question of the status of the seceded states. While I have considered the preservation of the constitutional power of the general government to be the foundation of our peace and safety at home and abroad, I yet believe that the maintenance of the rights and authority reserved in the states and to the people is not only essential to the adjustment and balance of the general system, but the safeguard to the continuance of a free government. I consider it as the chief source of stability to our present system, whereas the consolidation of the states into one vast republic, sure to be aggressive abroad and despotic at home, will be the certain precursor of that ruin which has overwhelmed all those that have preceded it. He cited then the various historic warnings in America against centralization of power and argued, by reference to the Hartford Convention and the Constitution of Massachusetts, that secession was conceded to be a right by two of the states that subsequently most opposed it. Judge Chase, the present Chief Justice of the U.S., he went on, as late as 1850, is reported to have stated in the Senate, of which he was a member, that he knew of no remedy in case of the refusal of a state to perform its stipulation, thereby acknowledging the sovereignty and independence of state action. Here Lee dropped the argument from the past and turned to the outlook. But I will not weary you with this unprofitable discussion and profitable because the judgment of reason has been displaced by the arbitrament of war, waged for the purpose as avowed of maintaining the union of the states. If, therefore, the result of the war is to be considered as having decided that the union of the states is inviolable and perpetual under the Constitution, it naturally follows that it is as incompetent for the general government to impair its integrity by the exclusion of a state as for the states to do so by secession, and that the existence and rights of a state by the Constitution are as indestructible as the union itself. The legitimate consequence then must be the perfect equality of rights of all the states, the exclusive right of each to regulate its internal affairs under rules established by the Constitution, and the right of each state to prescribe for itself the qualification of suffrage. The South had contended only for the supremacy of the Constitution and the just administration of the laws made in pursuance of it. Virginia to the last made great efforts to save the Union and urged harmony and compromise. Senator Douglas, in his remarks upon the Compromise Bill recommended by the Committee of Thirteen in 1861, stated that every member from the South, including Messrs. Toombs and Davis, expressed their willingness to accept the proposition of Senator Crittenden from Kentucky as a final settlement of the controversy, if sustained by the Republican Party, and that the only difficulty in the way of an amicable adjustment was with the Republican Party. Who then is responsible for the war? Although the South would have preferred any honorable compromise to the fratricidal war which has taken place, she now accepts in good faith its constitutional results and receives without reserve the amendment which has already been made to the Constitution for the extinction of slavery. That is an event that has long been sought, though in a different way, and by none has it been more earnestly desired than by citizens of Virginia. In other respects I trust that the Constitution may undergo no change, but that it may be handed down to succeeding generations in the form we received it from our forefathers. In summary, then, General Lee believed that the rights of the states must be preserved, though the right of secession admittedly was no longer among them. He did not think the federal government had the authority under the Constitution to dictate suffrage requirements to the states, though he was entirely willing that the prohibition of slavery should be written into the Constitution. He held that the southern states could not be denied their civil rights and their places in Congress under the theory of an indestructible union, a theory which the North itself supported. Like most Southerners, Lee supported President Johnson and of course opposed the program of the radicals. 
In July, 1866, he had written, Everyone approves of the policy of President Johnson, gives him his cordial support, and would, I believe, confer on him the presidency for another term, if it was in his power. In October, 1867, he told Longstreet, who seemingly desired his endorsement of some move in support of the Republicans, while I think we should act under the law and according to the law imposed upon us, I cannot think the course pursued by the dominant political party the one best for the interests of the country, and therefore cannot say so, or give them my approval. When Longstreet took a contrary course and joined the Republicans, Lee said General Longstreet has made a great mistake. Lee saw the temptation to which his old lieutenant yielded, and he frankly told General Chilton the South could expect no part in the administration of national affairs for many years. For that reason, among others, the South should turn her energies to the development of her industries. Despite the gloom of the political outlook, Christmas, 1866, was a pleasant season for the Lees. Not long before it, the general had a welcome visit from the old teacher of his youth, William B. Leary, to whom he gave a warm letter of personal endorsement. Rooney did not come up for the holidays, and Mildred was with friends in Maryland, but the other girls in Custis were at home, and Robert arrived on December 20. Yun Lee brought a familiar friend with him, none other than the sorrel mare, Lucy Long, that Jeb Stewart in the fall of 1862 had given his chief. From that time until the spring of 1864 the general had used her alternately with Traveller. Broken down then by hard riding and scanty feed, the mare had been sent out to Henry County, Virginia, to recuperate. Lee recalled her before the opening of the Appomattox campaign, but never received her. She got into a stable of government horses and was sent to Danville, where she either was stolen or else was carried off by some soldier when the Confederacy collapsed. In some way she reached Essex County, Virginia, where she was sold to an honest man. Her resemblance to the general's wartime mare having been noted, Lee learned of her whereabouts, proved her identity, and paid for her out of consideration for Stuart's memory. The horse was brought to young Robert Lee's during the autumn and was kept there until nearly Christmas. Then she was shipped by rail to Staunton, at which point Robert met her. I found their Colonel William Allen, wrote the junior Lee, who had a buggy and no horse, and as I had a horse and no buggy, we joined forces and I drove him over to Lexington, Lucy Long carrying us with great ease to herself and comfort to us. My father was glad to get her, as he was very fond of her. When he heard how she came over, he was really shocked, as he thought she had never been broken to harness. Lee gave Lucy long good care, of course, employing her chiefly as a riding horse for his daughters, but personally he almost always used Traveller. That silent veteran of his campaigns had a place in the general's heart next after his god, his country, his family, his veterans, and his boys. Much as he disliked having his own photograph taken, he was glad to suggest a picture of Traveller at the Rockbridge Baths, and when Marky Williams proposed to paint a picture of the horse, he wrote the detailed description already quoted, and was anxious to know how her work was progressing. The charger spent much of his time in the front yard of Lee's house, and he always received his master with the same toss of the head that had acknowledged the soldiers' cheers during the war. Lee often had sugar for the horse and sometimes was seen gazing silently at him as though recalling the scenes they had shared. Traveller enjoyed the easy, honored life he led at Lexington, but, like other heroes, he found that had to pay a price for fame. In his case, the souvenir hunters were his bane. They stole so much of his mane and tail that he became suspicious of all strangers and would never let any of them get behind him without exhibiting nervousness. However, he preserved docility with his master, and if he broke away, a whistle from Lee would halt him. Lee insisted that he could not see how any man could ride a horse for any length of time unless there developed a perfect understanding between rider and mount. Until 1869, in the course of an afternoon, the general frequently rode Traveller to Rockbridge Baths and back, a distance of twenty miles, and on the way he would often give him a stiff run, a breather, as he called it. Another favorite ride was to Colonel Ross's, where he would talk of farming. When he was away from Lexington, Lee sent messages to the horse, just as he did to the members of his family. How is Traveller? he inquired. Tell him I miss him dreadfully and have repented of our separation but once and that is the whole time since we parted. And again, I hope Traveller is well and wants for nothing. I want him more than ever now that I shall be alone. 
During a season when he boarded the animal in the country outside Lexington, he visited him every week, and when he was absent and a stranger was attending the horses, he left minute instructions for their care. On days when his mount had to be shod, the general stood by him during the ordeal. Have patience with Traveler, he urged the blacksmith as the horse danced about, he was made nervous by the bursting of bombs around him during the war. Members of the family who had gone from home on visits were regaled occasionally with news about the favorite steed. To Mildred he wrote that winter, Traveler and Custis are both well and pursue their usual dignified gait and habits, and are not led away by the frivolous entertainments of lectures and concerts. Such was his loyalty to Traveler that it was an ominous sign of his approaching end when Lee had to admit that the trot of his steed was getting harder. Rightly enough, on the day that Lee was buried, the horse followed directly behind the hearse. Other animals, too, shared the general's love during the years at Lexington, as they had during the period of the war. He kept a cow, after the manner of most village people in those days of open spaces, and he was distressed on his departure for the hot springs in the last summer of his life to leave the faithful milker sick. You do not mention the cow, he wrote back, she is of more interest to me than the cats, and is equally destructive of rats. A few days later he said, I am glad the cow is better. She stands next in my affections to Traveller. The news of her death drew this sorrowful comment, our good cow will be a loss to us, but her troubles are all over now, and I am grateful to her for what she has done for us. I hope that we did our duty to her. Dogs he esteemed somewhat less than in the days at Fort Hamilton, but he had a frequent mention of at least one canine. That was Ducky, a very small, helpless creature that Mr. and Mrs. Edward Child brought with them from France when they came on a visit. He had crossed the Atlantic in fear and trembling, Robert Lee recorded, and did not apparently enjoy the new world. His utter helplessness and the great care taken of him by his mistress, his ill health and the unutterable woe of his countenance greatly excited my father's pity. After he went away, he often spoke of him and referred to him, I find, in one of his letters. Near the end of his life, when Lee could not enjoy Traveller, because of the condition of his heart, he sought a dog. Writing to Fitz Lee, not a month before he died, the general said, your letter on the dog question has been unavoidably delayed. I thank you very sincerely for recollecting my wishes on the subject and, for, your steps to comply with them. First, I must inform you that it is not my purpose to put my dog to towing canal boats or hauling dirt carts, but want him to play the part of a friend and protector. His disposition is therefore of vital importance, he ought not to be too old to contract a friendship for me, neither is his size so important to me as a perfect form. Cats, of course, the women of the house had about them always, more numerously perhaps than Lee desired, but he made no protest. Whether Lee disliked some species of animals or not, their suffering pained him deeply. One winter, not far from Lexington, a forest fire added great beauty to the night. But when someone praised it to Lee, he could not wholly agree. It is beautiful, he admitted, but I have been thinking of the poor animals which must perish in the flames. The new year, 1867, brought a call. There still was a hope that Congress would leave President Johnson free to permit Virginia to elect a governor without military interference. Several possible conservative nominees were suggested. General Lee was the most conspicuous of them. It was not a new proposal. Besides the suggestion General Meade had made, John B. Baldwin the previous year had put forward Lee's name at a public meeting when it had met with much applause. Some of the radicals who had testified before the Reconstruction Committee were convinced that a plan was underway to name the general. By the end of January, 1867, sentiment for Lee was so strong that Judge Robert Ould wrote to know if he would accept the nomination. The general was sick when Ould's letter arrived, but he replied at once. He was appreciative, he wrote the judge, but he preferred private life, which he thought was better suited to his condition and age. He believed there were many more capable of filling the position and of promoting the interests of the people. He went on. I think it most important, in selecting a chief magistrate of the Commonwealth, for the citizens to choose one capable of fulfilling its high trust and at the same time not liable to the misconstruction which their choice of one objectionable to the general government would be sure to create and thereby increase the evils under with the state at present labors. 
I have no means of knowing, other than our apparent to you, whether my election as governor of Virginia would be personally injurious to me or not, and therefore the consideration of that question in your letter has not been embraced in my reply. But I believe it would be used by the dominant party to excite hostility toward the state and to injure the people in the eyes of the country, and I therefore cannot consent to become the instrument of bringing distress upon those whose prosperity and happiness are so dear to me. If my disfranchisement and privation of civil rights would secure to the citizens of the state the enjoyment of civil liberty and equal rights under the Constitution, I would willingly accept them in their stead. What I have written is intended only for your own information. To State Senator Cavill he said, as regards the mention of my name for the next governor that has been finally settled by the late Bill of Congress. But I expressed my views on the subject some time since to Mr. Ould of Richmond, who will no doubt disclose them to you if you desire. I believe my election would be injurious to Virginia, and I cannot therefore consent to become a candidate. Both these were serious answers, written at a serious time, and the tone is quite different from that of the polite but impersonal letters in which he so often rejected business offers. Evidently, he gave thought to the proposal. Although he had told Ben. Hill during the war that his talents were military, not civil, he might, in other circumstances, have looked favorably on Judge Ould's suggestion. He may have been influenced unconsciously by the fact that his father had been governor of Virginia after the Revolution. One of Mrs. Lee's ambitions for him was that he should end his career with the same honor. Very shortly after General Lee answered Judge Ould, the political outlook changed grimly for the worse. The radicals in Congress triumphed decisively over President Johnson and in the face of his veto, passed the first Reconstruction Act on March 2, 1867. In a supplementary law of March 23, this was elaborated. These two statutes subordinated to army officers the government of ten southern states, Virginia among them. The states themselves ceased to exist for the time in the eyes of the federal government and became military districts. Before they could be relieved of this armed rule and allowed representation in Congress again, each of the ten states must elect a constitutional convention on the basis of manhood suffrage, Negroes included. Further, this convention had to draft a constitution giving the ballot to all male adults. The people were thereupon to ratify the new constitution, and Congress, if it saw fit, was to approve. Then a legislature, chosen as required by the modified organic law, was to meet and accept the 14th Amendment to the federal constitution. This amendment contained a section disqualifying for office virtually all those who had held official position and had thrown in their lot with the Confederacy. On March 13, 1867, the first Reconstruction Act was proclaimed in Virginia. On that day, the proud Old Dominion became military district number one. Dictatorial power to remove functionaries, to make appointments, to hold a general registration, and to initiate all the steps required under the new federal law was vested in the soldier who had for some time been in charge of the Union forces garrisoning Virginia, Major General John M. Schofield. What should Virginians do about this harsh legislation? Should they passively resist? Should they refrain from participating in the elections, or should they save what they might? In a bitterness of spirit they had not felt in 1865 people asked these questions. It was one thing to be defeated in war, it was quite another to see Congress enact laws avowedly designed to disfranchise white men and to subject them to the political domination of their former slaves. It is bad enough, Mrs. Lee indignantly wrote Mrs. Chilton, to be the victims of tyranny, but when it is wielded by such cowards and base men as Butler, Thaddeus and Turner it is indeed intolerable. The country that allows such scum to rule them must be fast going to destruction and we shall care little if we are not involved in the crash. And again, they still desire to grind, the South, to dust and wish to effect this purpose by working on the feelings of the low and ignorant Negroes many of whom do not even comprehend what a vote means. Dot. My indignation cannot be controlled and I wonder our people, helpless and disarmed as they are, comma, can bear it. Oh God how long? These were the sentiments of thousands who looked to Lee for guidance. He had followed the newspapers the previous year, but as the climax approached, he avoided reading the attacks delivered in Congress on the South. Nor would he now permit himself to be brought into the controversy through the public prints. 
In three private letters, however, he set forth his opinions freely, and in at least one instance, an accurate though unauthorized statement of his views was printed in a newspaper very soon after the passage of the Reconstruction Act. It this public statement that prompted him, in answer to an inquiry from his friend Judge Robert Ould of Richmond, to express his opinion of Virginia's duty. Under date of March 29, 1867, he wrote as follows. My dear sir, I received this Monier letter of the 26th inst, and do not know on what authority my opinions have been announced in the public papers. It was certainly not by mine, and from what I am told remarks are attributed to me of which I have no knowledge. When the Sherman Bill became a law and its execution imperative, I considered right and just to the people of the state that it should be submitted as required for their action and that the call for a convention should be legitimately and properly made. I have never read the bill passed by the Senate of Virginia for that purpose, and do not know its provisions, but if there was then a difference of opinion as to the proper mode, there can be none since the passage of the supplemental bill, and I think all persons entitled to vote should attend the polls and endeavor to elect the best available men to represent them in the convention, to whose decision everyone should submit. The preservation of harmony and kind feelings is of the utmost importance, and all good citizens should exert themselves to secure it and to prevent the division of the people into parties. The interests of all are inseparably connected and can only be preserved by our united wisdom and strength. I think it useless to offer arguments to show the propriety of this course. Its advantages are too manifest. It is extremely unpleasant to me, for reasons which I think will occur to you, that my name should be unnecessarily brought before the public, and I do not see that any good can result from it. I hope therefore you will not publish my letter, but that you will try and allay the strife that I fear may arise in the state. With great regard, your OBT served. R. E. Lee As the wrath of the South rose in resentment of the federal legislation, Lee had to urge his view with tact. The South, he wrote General Dabney H. Morey, was acting under compulsion. Each state should consult its best interests as far as it could. The Reconstruction Act would be carried out, a convention would be called, and a constitution drafted. As that was certain, the question, then, is, shall the members of the convention be selected from the best available men in the state, or the worst? The radicals would be well pleased, he presumed, if they and the Negroes were left to make the new organic law of the Commonwealth. In the circumstances, he thought it the duty of all citizens who were not disfranchised to qualify and to vote for the best men they could get to be candidates for the convention. When that body met, it should determine what should be done, and in its decision the whole white population should acquiesce. He did not so state in plain words, but he left it to be inferred that if the convention decided it should enfranchise the Negroes in order to procure the readmission of Virginia into the Union, the people should endorse this action. Although, the convention's decision may not be considered at the time the most advantageous, he said in his other letter on the Reconstruction Acts, it should be recollected that it can be improved as opportunity offers, and in the end I trust all things will work together for our good. He refused to despair of the future, though greater calamity, in his opinion, might yet result from the misunderstanding between the sections. The dominant party cannot reign forever, he had written one of his sons in February, and truth and justice will at last prevail. The present condition of affairs, he told an unnamed Petersburg lady, is, as you state, calculated to cause much anxiety, but not enough, in my opinion, to cause us to despond or to cease in our efforts to direct events to a favorable issue and in June he wrote Rooney, in language curiously rhetorical for him, although the future is still dark and the prospects gloomy, I am confident that, if we all unite in doing our duty and earnestly work to extract what good we can out of the evil that now hangs over our dear land, the time is not distant when the angry cloud will be lifted from our horizon and the sun in his pristine brightness again shine forth. Within the college, the session of 18661867 passed quickly amid the exactions of a thousand duties. Visitors came in the usual numbers. Among them was William Swinton, author of the campaigns of the Army of the Potomac, who was then traveling through the South, collecting from Confederate leaders some of the historical material he used in his twelve decisive battles of the war. He seems to be gentlemanly, Lee confided to Rooney, in manifest relief, after Swinton's departure, but I derive no pleasure from my interviews with bookmakers. I have either to appear uncivil or run the risk of being dragged before the public. The intermediate examinations were stiff. 
The ordeal through which the higher classes passed, Lee wrote his still-absent daughter, was as severe as any I ever witnessed. The general level of performance was high, and the students were serious. Lee himself seems to have shared in the general pursuit of knowledge, for he took from the library a volume on calculus and presumably regaled himself in the realm of his favorite mathematics. He found time, too, to think once again of the history of his campaigns he still hoped to write, though he had told Acton he was progressing slowly in the collection of the necessary documents. In March occurred the session's gravest breach of discipline. Some of the students heard there was to be a speech-making to the Negroes on the evening of the 22d and, boy-like, five of them determined to attend. One of the group foolishly took a pistol with him. They went to the Freedmen's Church and, finding it dark, decided that the meeting must be at the schoolhouse, so they tramped thither. On their arrival, the student who carried the pistol approached a window to see if there was a gathering within. Immediately a Negro accosted him, cursed him, and made a motion as if to draw a weapon. The student took out his own firearm and started to beat the Negro, but presently desisted and went away with his companions. In some manner he eluded arrest, but the four others were brought before the mayor and were tried. As soon as General Lee heard of the affair, he summoned the quartet who had been in court. When they came, the student who had been engaged in the altercation also appeared. In accordance with the honor system of the college, he explained that circumstances and assumed the entire blame. He was promptly expelled and the others were reprimanded. Three weeks later the assistant superintendent of the Freedmen's Bureau wrote General Lee on the subject, apparently determined to make an issue of it, but he dropped the matter, it seems, after Lee wrote him the facts in the case. A month before commencement, President Davis was released on bail from his long confinement at Fort Monroe, Virginia. General Lee had felt from the first the injustice of making the Confederate president a scapegoat, and he had consulted with friends to see if anything could be done in Mr. Davis's behalf. He had carried his wartime chief on his heart and in his prayers, confident of his acquittal if brought to trial, yet sensitive to Mr. Davis's sufferings. The news that Davis was at last free from prison, General Lee received with relief and thankfulness. He wrote the former executive, You can conceive better than I can express the misery which your friends have suffered from your long imprisonment and the other afflictions incident thereto. To none has this been more painful than to me, and the impossibility of affording relief has added to my distress. Your release has lifted a load from my heart which I have not words to tell, and my daily prayer to the great ruler of the world is, that he may shield you from all future harm, guard you from all evil, and give you the peace which the world cannot take away. That the rest of your days may be triumphantly happy is the sincere and earnest wish of your most obedient, faithful friend and servant. Doubtless the feelings expressed in this letter brightened the commencement for General Lee. During the final exercises, when the trustees met, they had no report of large gifts to the endowment during the year, except for one donation from the Ladies' Association of Louisville, Kentucky. Some of the subscriptions previously made had not been met. The solicitors of the college, however, had gathered many small pledges and some cash during the year. Rev. E. P. Walton returned $27,950, exclusive of gifts under $100, as compared with $45,280 in 18651866. As students had paid $22,000 for tuition, the trustees had some latitude in making appropriations at their June meeting. A boarding house, or commons, to cost $5,000 was authorized, though this action was later rescinded. Certain needed land was purchased. Laboratory apparatus costing $6,700 was ordered to be paid for over a period of three years. $1,000 were set aside for advertising. Commutation of $300 was allowed each of the professors to whom the college did not supply a house. Even the expense of a band to enliven the commencement exercises was approved. Nor were these the only outlays sanctioned. It was General Lee's custom, during the meetings of the trustees, to report and then to retire in order that the board might be under no restraint in debating his recommendations. While he was absent from the room at the June meeting, the building committee was instructed to contract at once for the erection of a new house for the president at a cost of $12,000, later raised to $15,000. 
General Lee did not think this should be done and argued that other improvements should have precedence, but there was no gain saying the trustees. No new professors were elected because funds for the endowment of the additional chairs had not been raised. The only change in duties was the creation of the combined office of clerk and librarian at a salary of $600 per annum. Arrangements with Judge Brockenbrough for the operation of the law school were continued another year. The Committee on Instruction expressed its gratification at the work of the session and had no reforms to suggest. If the second year offered no such dazzling comparisons as could have been made at the end of the session of 18651866, it was because the transformation had already occurred. Everything now depended on enlarged endowment. The assets of the college, as of January, 1867, were estimated by General Lee as follows, buildings, $40,000, grounds, $10,000, apparatus, exclusive of prospective purchases, $1,000, endowment, including securities not paying interest, $190,000. Salaries were $11,000 per annum and tuition receipts, as already noted, were $22,000. The school, Lee had written in March, was progressing as well as could be expected. He believed at the time that in another year he would have done all he could at the college and that he could retire to some quiet spot east of the mountains where he could prepare a home for Mrs. Lee and his daughters. Confinement, he had told an old friend, agrees less with me even than labor in the field. To Marky Williams he had written a year before, I am easily wearied now and look forward with joy to the time, which is fast approaching, that I can lay, sick, down and rest. Chapter 18, A Social Conciliator As college work at the end of the session of 18667 was better organized than it had been the previous summer, the general could take a vacation, a needed one, for he had been almost continuously at work since he had moved to Lexington, nearly two years before. First there came a trip to a lovely mountain, the Peaks of Otter, about 30 miles away, in Bedford County. It was undertaken on horseback, with his daughter Mildred, who had at last returned home after her lengthy visit in Maryland. The road led through a thinly settled, picturesque country, the beauty of which, in the verdure of late June, appealed profoundly to General Lee. His spirits were high and Traveller was prancing, as they made their way over the hills, with Mildred at his side on Lucy Long lunching by the road, they came in the afternoon to the James River, where the ferryman proved to be a veteran of the Army of Northern Virginia. He refused to accept anything for conveying his old commander across the stream. Up the valley of the James the two riders climbed, past mountain cabins and occasional prosperous homes. Out where the road was the steepest, they came upon a group of dirty-faced youngsters at play. The general spoke to them, he never passed children without doing so, and asked jestingly if they did not think some water would help their countenances. The children gaped and ran away. Presently the riders made a turn in the winding road, and down from a cabin, now visible for the first time, trooped the same youngsters, in clean aprons, their faces hurriedly but surely washed, and their hair combed. We know you are General Lee, cried one of the group. We have got your picture. Their toilet was in his honor. The hotel at the Peaks of Otter nestles unassumingly in the high gap that leads over the mountain. The eminence that visitors are wont to climb lies directly above. On horseback one may get within 700 yards of the crest, which is 4,000 feet above sea level, a high mountain for that friendly range. Walking from the hotel, the distance to the summit by a difficult track is a mile and a quarter, and by the easy route, two miles and a half. The general and his daughter arrived at the hotel about nine o'clock in the evening, spent the night there, and very early the next morning set out for the mountaintop under the escort of the proprietor. They rode an Indian file as far as the horses could scramble and then they went on afoot. When the crest was reached, the general sat down on one of the rocks and studied the far-sweeping landscape below him. He had little to say and seemed very sad. Was it that the magnificence of the blue panorama stirred him deeply, as noble scenery often did, or was he wondering about the future of the people of Military District No. 1 whose homes were spread out before his vision? Down from the mountain and straight on toward Liberty, county seat of Bedford, father and daughter rode. On the way a sudden thunder shower overtook them and forced them to gallop back to the nearest cabin. The general lifted the girl off the horse and hurried her into the house, while he led the animals to the shed. 
When he came back the atmosphere in the tiny dwelling was uncomfortable, the reticent mountain woman had not been pleased that a stranger of her sex had come dripping into her house, forming pools of water wherever she paused on the clean floor. Still less, now, did she relish the arrival of a booted man who was tramping mud on the board she had laboriously scoured white. The general sensed her indignation and almost in the breath that he asked permission to remain until the rain had passed, he apologized for marring the beauty of a floor he gallantly extolled. Somewhat mollified, the housewife invited her guests into her best room, which her absent husband, a veteran of the Army of Northern Virginia, had adorned with pictures of Lee and Jackson, Davis and Johnston. She did not associate the man before her, in the wet coat, with the soldier whose likeness was on her wall, but she was measurably appeased, as is the way of mortals, with the continuing praise of the bearded cavalier. After a while, when the thundercloud had gone over, the general bowed his way out and went for the horses. In his absence, Mildred obligingly told her hostess who he was. The woman seemed stunned, the general's daughter wrote, and her startled mind ran on to the return of her husband to whom she would break the incredible news that his old commander had been under his roof. What will Joey say, what will Joey say, she kept repeating. That afternoon the general and Mildred reached Avenal, in the little town of Liberty, the home of William M. Burwell, a connection of theirs. Back among the people of her own sort, Mildred sought to dress appropriately. When she came downstairs for the evening, her father was surprised to see her glorified in crinoline, her own crinoline at that. How was it done, when she had brought no luggage with her, other than her saddlebag? The general had to be advised, in his masculine ignorance, that a resourceful young lady of fashion could contrive to roll up her hoops until she was able to squeeze them into the saddlebags, and, in due season, to be ready for suitors or for ceremonies. The general was greatly amused. That night and the next day, Sunday, were spent at Avenal. Monday morning the two rode westward again, paralleling the line of the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad for about twelve miles until they reached the home of Captain Pascal Buford at the site of the present Montvale. The captain was a successful old farmer whose extensive property had been little injured by moving armies and roving commissaries. He had entertained Mrs. Lee, Mary, and Agnes for a short time during the war, and he was delighted now to see the general and another of his daughters. They spent the afternoon going over the Buford farm, and at night they sat down to a supper so bountiful that it almost overflowed the table. When the meal and the evening chat were over, and Mr. Buford was showing his guests to their rooms, the general thoughtfully inquired at what time they should be ready for breakfast. Well, general, said Buford indulgently, as you have been riding hard, and as you are company, we will not have breakfast tomorrow till sunup. The general, of course, did not allow himself to smile, and doubtless he was ready to sit down at table on Tuesday morning the very minute the rim of the sun shone over the horizon, but in the Lee family circle, for many a day thereafter, he delighted to tell of the kindly host whose consideration for his guest prompted him to defer breakfast until 4.30. That fifth day away from home was pleasantly passed at Captain Buford's. On Wednesday, the general and Mildred covered the 41 miles back to Lexington, by way of Buchanan and Natural Bridge. It was a pleasant excursion after so long a period of all-consuming labor. Mrs. Lee's condition had not been favorable during the spring, for she had worried over the course of the reconstruction. Often she made herself indignant by reading the newspapers, but she could hardly leave them alone, because, as she explained, few books were available and she had no employment if she did not read. I know you long sometimes for the banks of the Potomac and James, she confided to an old friend. I confess I do, dot. These mountains seem to shut out all I used to know and love, comma, yet I am thankful we have found an asylum here and such kind people. Her invalidism was so confirmed that she wrote, The greatest feat I can expect to accomplish will be to walk across my room without crutches, and even that I have no hope of accomplishing. The general felt, as he had in peaceful years before the war, that a change of scene would do her good and that the mineral waters of some popular springs might relieve her rheumatism. He left the choice of a resort to her, and she selected the Greenbrier White Sulphur, merely on the ground, I believe, that General wrote Rooney, that she has never tried those waters, and, therefore, they might be of service to her. As soon as he got back from the peaks of Otter, he began to make his preparation to take her to the spa, a long, bone-breaking journey by railroad and conveyance over the mountains. 
Sometime in July the party set out, Mrs. Lee, Agnes, Miss Mary Pendleton, and Custis. They were to go by the stage to Goshen, thence by train to Covington, and on from that town by horse-drawn vehicles to the Springs, which were across the new state line in Greenbrier County, West Virginia. General Lee rode ahead on Traveler, accompanied by Captain Professor J. J. White, was becoming a close friend. After a night at Covington, the adventurers climbed into the clumsy old four-wheelers and made ready for the last struggle with the mountain roads. The hotel proprietor had reserved a special coach for the Lees and now sent out lunch with his compliments. When the drivers were about to give the word, the general discovered that the other vehicles were overcrowded while there were vacant seats in the one assigned his party. He insisted that some of those who were uncomfortably placed should travel with Mrs. Lee, an invitation he did not have to repeat. Off rumbled the carriages, with Lee and White still on horseback. Traveller and his companions soon outdistanced the coaches and brought their riders in good time to the halfway house, where it was customary to break the journey with a wash, a lunch, and a rest in a quiet, darkened room after the noise and dust of the road. The general had quarters reserved for Mrs. Lee and happened to be on the stairs when, below him, he heard some young girls from Maryland trying to coax the maid into finding them a chamber in the crowded little tavern. She apologized volubly but kept explaining that all the space had been taken. When the general smiled at the colloquy, the girls for the first time became conscious of his presence. They looked up at him and, though they had never seen him before, they identified him on the instant. Nearly sixty years after, one of the two recalled her impressions of that moment. The man who stood before us, the embodiment of a lost cause, was the realized King Arthur. The soul that looked out of his eyes was as honest and fearless as when it first looked on life. One saw the character, as clear as crystal, without complications or seals, and the heart, as tender as that of ideal womanhood. The years which have passed since that time have dimmed many enthusiasms and destroyed many illusions, but have caused no blush at the memory of the swift thrill of recognition and reverence which ran like an electric flash through one's whole body. At once the general insisted that the young ladies, who also were on their way to the white sulphur, should refresh themselves in Mrs. Lee's room. They were mortified that he had overheard their complaints, but they accepted his courtesy with blushing thanks. For a few moments they talked with him, and that day they laid the foundation of a friendship to which history owes one of the most interesting accounts of the social life of General Lee. Ending a hard journey, the family reached White Sulphur that afternoon. At the time, and for forty years thereafter, this resort consisted of a rambling central hotel, a huge wooden structure with long, wide porches, beyond which were rows of small cottages, each of them usually occupied by a single family. General Lee had the Harrison Cottage in Baltimore Row, and around him he found many whom he had known in the old days before the Potomac had become a chasm. He ate in the main dining room at a table with W. W. Corcoran of Washington, Mildred Lee, Miss Pendleton, and Custis. Mrs. Lee's meals, of course, were served in her cottage. The social impulse of the general was always strong, and now, in renewed contact with long separated friends, it asserted itself vigorously. For such another period in his life one had to go back to the years at Fort Monroe. He did not write of social happenings as exuberantly in 1867 as he did in 1833 he left to the women of the family the chronicling of arrivals and departures, but he unmistakably enjoyed the company. Young gallants at the Springs admired him, of course, but kept at a distance, for he overawed them. The older men, in some instances, he purposely avoided, because they were forever talking of the war and of politics, two subjects he considered it his duty to leave alone. With the women guests, particularly the girls, he seemed less reserved. Apparently, Miss Bond concluded, he felt among the maidens a safety from intrusion which he could not have among those to whom his personality, and the great issues which he represented, were uppermost thoughts. The center of the social life of the White was the parlor of the main hotel. It was a vast place, nearly always thronged. Here, writes Miss Bond, everyone took part in a promenade up and down the great uncarpeted space, not usually in couples, but in lines of three or four. Here introductions took place, here engagements were made, and this was the stranger's opportunity to be absorbed into the strenuous stream of life. On the evening of his arrival, it was expected that the general would come into the parlor, and there was some hurried consultation as to how he should be received. 
Some honor, of course, must be shown him, but would applause embarrass him? Before the question could be answered, Lee entered. There was a moment's hush, and then, as if by common impulse, everyone rose and remained silent and standing until he took a seat. After that, assured that no demonstration would be made, he went regularly into the parlor, and as often as he did so, he was surrounded by groups of young women, with whom he talked, half seriously, half jestingly. If new girls came to the hotel, he saw that they were made to feel at home. The homeliest and least known were as sure to receive his courteous attention as the fairest or the most aristocratic. When flirtations developed, and they were many, the general followed them with interest. Not a few love affairs had their origin in his introductions. He kept to his old habit of pretending to seek sweethearts for his sons, and while Custis remained at the White that summer with the family, the general pledged him to at least one of his young favorites. Custis was as modest as his father, and self-conscious besides, and was not at all willing to be delivered. For a long time he refused to share in the promenade. When at last he consented and was introduced, he became a resigned attendant on the salons, but usually he stood silently by the young lady to whom the general had promised him as a cavalier. General Custis, she said, one morning, why do you not sit down? He answered, I am a modest man, and for a modest man to have his hands and his feet on his mind at the same time is too much, when I stand, my feet are off my mind and I have only my hands to attend to. But Custis Lee was not always silent or embarrassed. He found, in some fashion, that a freckled-faced young girl, with a dumpy figure, had a father who had shown kindness to Confederate prisoners, among whom had been soldiers of his own command. Forthwith Custis decided that the girl, who up to that time had received no attention at the resort, should be a bell. He called in the Confederate veterans and asked them to aid him. They gallantly consented. From that day on, never had a girl a more attentive following. How she danced and walked and flirted. How she was encircled by a brilliant group, all bent upon doing her honor. No doubt her children proudly cherish yet the memory of the time when their quiet, plain little mother was the belle of the white. General Lee was greatly delighted at the girl's pleasure and at the device his retiring son had hit upon for repaying, as far as he might, the generous action of her father. Lee's quiet participation in the promenades and his talk with guests occupied only a small part of the long summer days. There are some five hundred people here, he wrote Robert in August, very pleasant and kind, but most of my time is passed alone with Traveller in the mountains. Sometimes he had companions or found them. One day two of his feminine friends made a bargain to ascend the mountains behind the hotel. It was a remote, rough place where he did not think women should venture alone. So, after they had started, he rode Traveller up the steep grade until he came upon them. I overheard you this morning planning to climb the mountain, he said very simply, and I could not suffer you to go unattended. With your permission, I will accompany you. He offered a seat on his steed to each of them in turn, but as neither would accept a lift, he led the horse by the bridle rein and walked up with them. He did not leave them until they were safely back in sight of the hotel. Often his entire ramble was in solitude, but not in loneliness, for it was a rule with him to occupy his hours of exercise with pleasant meditations and with a study of whatever beauty he might find. When I was with the army, he once told a nephew, I had to take daily rides in order to obtain the exercise that was necessary for me. When I got on my horse, no matter what battle or movement was impending, and no matter what my cares or troubles were, I put all such things out of my mind and thought only of my ride, of the scenery around me, or of other pleasant things, and so returned to my work refreshed and relieved and in a better and stronger condition. If it had not been for, power, to do this, I do not see how I could have stood what I had to go through with. Those weeks at the White were not entirely made up of restful rides and light talk. Northern people were beginning to visit the springs again, they did not always show the spirit of reconciliation, nor were they received with it. The women were more resentful than the men, and as they were much more numerous, any vindictiveness on the part of the northerners was met with something akin to social ostracism. Against every manifestation of this spirit General Lee felt he should exert himself publicly. If former federal officers avoided him, through consideration for his sensibilities, he quite subordinated the past to the present in a desire to see Southern hospitality vindicated and the strangers put at ease. 
He was thoughtful, too, in dealing with the northern ladies, also, and sought, as far as he could, to break up the ice of animosity. One northern family group, though bearing a noted name, was so forbidding in manner that not a single member of General Lee's circle made the acquaintance of any of them. When the general discovered this, while he was chatting in the parlor, he reminded his girlfriends of their duty to be hospitable and said that as nobody could present him, he would introduce himself to the austere guests. Would any of the young people go across the room with him for that purpose? Only one was willing. I will go, General Lee, she said, under your orders. Not under my orders, he answered, but it will gratify me deeply to have your assistance. As they started, he told her of his grief at finding Southern young people so bitter. But, General Lee, the girl broke out, did you never feel resentment toward the North? He stopped and in a low voice answered, I believe I may say, looking into my own heart and speaking as in the presence of God, that I have never known one moment of bitterness or resentment. Then, after a pause, he told her, when you go home I want you to take a message to your friends. Tell them for me that it is unworthy of them as women, and especially as Christian women, to cherish feelings of resentment against the North. Tell them that it grieves me inexpressibly to know that such a state of things exists, and that I implore them to do their part to heal our country's wounds. With that he went on and, after introducing himself and presenting his youthful companion, sat down with the group whom the young girls, in his presence, did not dare call Yankees. The invisible restraint which had existed in social intercourse between the representatives of the different sections still remained, but the example and influence of the illustrious leader modified its expression and led to exchanges of courtesies, so, years after, wrote the woman who had crossed the floor with him and had braved the frigid bearing of the strangers. A rumor passed around the piazza one day that General Grant was to visit the White. Everyone began to speculate on what would happen when the two former adversaries met. One young girl, some of us would gladly have slain her on the spot, wrote Miss Bond, had the hardihood to inquire, well, General Lee, they say General Grant is coming here next week, what will you do then? A faraway look came into his eyes. He passed by the bad taste of the question. If General Grant comes, he said, I shall welcome him to my home, show him all the courtesy which is due from one gentleman to another, and try to do everything in my power to make his stay here agreeable. Despite the good manners of most of the guests, Lee had to contend with some fire-eaters and, what was worse, with some rhetorical admirers. One man of this type kept asking for an introduction to the general. He was so bombastic in his speech that the friend of the Lees to whom he made the request hesitated to present him. However, one evening, as they were in front of the Lee cottage, there seemed to be no way of avoiding an introduction, though the general and Mrs. Lee were at the time entertaining some callers. No sooner was the man's name pronounced than he began, Do I behold the honored roof that shelters the head of him before whose name the luster of Napoleon's pales into a shadow? Do I see the walls within which sits the most adored of men? Dare I tread the floor which she who is a scion of the patriotic house of the revered Washington condescends to hallow with her presence? Is this the portico that trails its vines over the noble pair? The general was bewildered and the guests were aghast, but Mrs. Lee, as always, was mistress of her own home. Calmly and with a kind look she interrupted the flow of nonsense. Yes, she said, this is our cabin, will you take a seat upon the bench? Before the time came to leave the White, at the end of a three-week sojourn, General Lee was taken sick. In a short while, he recovered sufficiently to ride over to the old suite, whither the family then moved, for it was the fashion of the day to go to at least two or even three springs in a season. After his arrival, his physical distress grew into a real illness, superinduced, as Lee thought, by a cold. It seems to me, he wrote later, for all the sickness I ever had experienced in my life was put together, it would not equal the attack I experienced. His recovery was slow, and the seizure, whatever its nature, left him feeble. Fortunately, the quarters were quite comfortable. One of the parlors on the first floor was made into a bedroom so that Mrs. Lee could be rolled about on the porch and into the ballroom to watch the dancers. While the general was slowly getting better, some of the mountaineers came to the hotel with fruit for sale. When they saw their old commander, for they were survivors of his army, they forgot their trade and raised the rebel yell. 
and after the general acknowledged their tribute by shaking hands with each of them, they insisted that he accept the contents of their baskets. Such incidents were of frequent occurrence, wherever he went he met men who had served under him. Whether they had saved something from their country's wreck or were fighting with black poverty, they wanted to do what they could and to give him what they had, to show their affection for him. Early in September it was arranged that Custis should escort home his mother, his sister, and Miss Pendleton, and that the general should return by a more leisurely journey, halting for his health at three resorts along the way. He reached Healing Springs on September 10, and was still so much indisposed that he had to remain there until the 13th or 14th. He then went on by easy stages and reached Lexington on the 17th. He had been away from the college almost continuously since its close the previous June. As he had rested, he should have been re-established in health, but there had begun to creep more frequently into his letters an occasional sentence indicating his belief that he was getting old and that the end was not far distant. A sense of weakness, and perhaps a note of weariness, too, appear in his family correspondence. I am still so feeble, he wrote Rooney on September 20, that I cannot attend to the pressing business connected with the college. Again, in contrast to his old-time gaiety, he wrote the beautiful Talcott, who was still beautiful despite war and time, trouble and distress seem to pervade every part of the world, and peace and happiness are secure in none. Chapter 19, The Return to Petersburg Rooney Lee, it will be remembered, had lost his highborn wife, Charlotte Wickham, during December, 1863, while he was a prisoner of war. In 1867, when he was 30, Rooney, Fitzhugh now in the general's correspondence, began to pay attention to another girl of fine station, Miss Mary Tab Balling, a daughter of G. M. Balling of Petersburg, Virginia. By August of that year, it was known in the Lee family that Rooney hoped to marry her. His father heard the news with interest, for he had met her during the siege of Petersburg and he liked her. After the general had returned from the springs in September, 1867, word came that the charming lady had capitulated to the cavalryman. The general promptly wrote Rooney his unqualified congratulations. I have the most pleasant recollection of Miss Tab, he said, and of her kindness to me, and now that she has consented to be my daughter the measure of my gratitude is filled to overflowing. I hope she will not delay the consummation, for I want to see her very much, and I fear she will not come to see me until then. You must present her my warm love, and you both must accept my earnest prayers and most fervent wishes for your future happiness and prosperity. As soon as the approximate date for the wedding was set, the general was most warmly urged to attend the ceremonies. His mind was reluctant. He had not yet entirely recovered from the illness of the summer, and, in the second place, he told himself he would have little opportunity of seeing his son and the bride in the rush of a great affair. But his chief reason for declining, though he may not have realized it, lay very much deeper, in his most personal and most profound reactions to the outcome of the war. He had never been disturbed about his own fate and he had never pitted himself. Broken-hearted and despairing he never had been. He had agonized, however, over the plight of the southern people, so many of whom, in person or by letter, had poured out their sorrows to him. The grief that many saw in his face after the war, it may be repeated, was wholly theirs, grief for the maimed men who were losing their battle to earn a living, grief for the women who were trying to rear children without a father, and grief for a land that had lost its power and wealth and now lay shackled and prostrate. For none was that grief keener than for the people of Petersburg, that stout-hearted city of grim memory. In them, he saw the suffering of the whole South. Never did he think of them otherwise than with the deepest sorrow, and he dreaded to visit again the scenes of his travail of soul during the last winter of the war. But what would be the wedding of a Lee if the general were not present? How, indeed, could there be fitting nuptials without him? Fitzhugh must have felt sharply the point of the question, for he journeyed to Lexington and so persuasively pleaded his case that the general consented to attend. Lee's first plan was to visit his sons on their farms and then to go on to Petersburg, but he abandoned this idea and prepared to proceed by way of Richmond only. He ordered in the old capital a new suit of broadcloth for the occasion, perhaps the first clothes he had bought since the war, except the trousers made near Derwent. From necessary economy he had been wearing his old grey coats. While the arrangements for the wedding were being matured, General Lee was served with a subpoena to appear as a witness on November 26 at the Federal Circuit Court in Richmond. 
Custis was summoned, also. It was assumed, though not certainly known, that some new step was to be taken in the trial of President Davis. Either by chance or else to save the cost and trouble of a second trip, the ceremonies were definitely set for November 28, during the week the general was to appear in Richmond. Consequently, when he left Lexington it was on a double mission, half joyful, half sad, half social, half legal. Accompanied by Custis, he reached Richmond on the afternoon of November 25th and went to the Exchange Hotel, where Rooney was awaiting him. Lee had been to the city only once since he had left for Oakland, late in June, 1865, and on that single visit, in the interest of the college, he had kept very much in retirement. Now he felt he could allow himself social pleasure without making himself conspicuous. Some activity would have been forced on him, perhaps, even if he had been unwilling. After supper, on his first evening at the hotel, when he attempted to go through the lobby, he was at once surrounded by men who knew him and had served under him. All of them greeted him with great cordiality. Strangers and northerners joined the crowd that sought to shake his hand. It was the first time since the war that a promiscuous crowd in any southern city had the opportunity of showing its affection for him and its admiration of the course he had pursued after Appomattox. He may have been surprised and moved by the spontaneous warmth of welcome, but he was destined to discover that every other city of the South had the same feeling for him. When he could escape from the hotel, he started on a round of visits. One was to the Caskies, at the southeast corner of 11th and Clay, which had been one Richmond home of his family before they had moved to the Stewart House on Franklin Street. Mildred was now visiting Norvell Caskey and was very happy, her father wrote, because she had a train about two yards longer than her young hostesses. During the course of the evening, General Lee went also to Jesuits, and there, for the first time since that Black March of 1865, he saw Jefferson Davis. The former president had come to Richmond to appear before the federal court on the treason charge. Neither of the two leaders of the Confederacy nor anyone who witnessed the meeting left any record of what they said or how they looked as they faced each other, both of them under indictment, there in the old capital, now a part of military district number one, garrisoned by their one-time adversaries. Probably the conversation was deliberately social and casual, for a number of people were present. He looks astonishingly well, General Lee wrote Mrs. Lee, and is quite cheerful. He inquired particularly after you all. The next day, November 26, obedient to the summons of the court, General Lee presented himself at the federal building, whither he had gone so often during the war to confer with the chief executive. He found Mr. Davis there once again, ready to be tried if the government chose, and he had a long and pleasant chat with his former chief as they waited. The expectation had been that the Chief Justice would come down from Washington and sit with Judge Underwood, but as Chase did not appear, all that could be done was to impanel a grand jury. Though the reason for this was not announced, it was with an eye to drawing a new and fuller indictment against Mr. Davis. The jury was mixed, white men and Negroes, and it was harangued at length by the judge. Upon its retirement, the clerk read the list of witnesses. Lee's name came first. Spectators grew silent, awaiting his answer. They were disappointed, for the general was in another room at the moment and did not hear the crier. The district attorney rose immediately and explained obligingly that Lee was in the city and would be ready at any time to go before the grand jury. Other witnesses were thereupon called. For the remainder of November 26, Lee was overwhelmed with visitors. Everyone knew he was in Richmond, everyone, it seemed, was anxious to call on him. He spent an exceedingly busy ten hours and must have been as weary as he was gratified. The grand jury took its time and did not summon the general again until the next day. Ushered in at 2 p.m., he was subjected to the jury's inquisition. He was, of course, an unwilling witness. Judging from the indictment returned on March 26, 1868, the evidence he was required to give the jurors had to do solely with known military movements, which the grand jury presented as proof of armed insurrection against the authority of the United States. Apparently, there was no effort to probe into the personal relations of President Davis and General Lee, and no attempt to bring out any of the inner history of the Confederacy. The whole of the treason proceedings, in fact, dealt with facts familiar to every American of the time. 
After his two hours in the jury room, General Lee was excused from further attendance. The following afternoon, November 28, he joined the large wedding party that was to go over to Petersburg, a distance of 22 miles, on a special car attached to the regular train. Perhaps the restraint of the jury room was still upon him. Doubtless memories, as bitter as brave, had been aroused by the questioning of the grand jury. All these were revived as the train made its way southward. The wedding guests were chattering and laughing, as youth has a right to do, the general sat silent and sad-faced. In spite of his rule to think of the past as little as he could, he must have been pondering all the black yesterdays brought up as he passed places of bloody contest and familiar name, Drury's Bluff, the Howlett Line, Bermuda Hundred, and Port Walthall Junction, where Whiting had failed Beauregard. A little more and Lee would approach the bridges over which part of the army had passed that dreadful night of April 2, 1865. On the left, close to the river, would be Fort Stedman. To the right and westward, scarcely out of range, would be Old Blandford Church, the Crater, Fort Mahone, and, farther away, the Boydton Plank Road, Fort Gregg, the Turnbull House, and Hatcher's Run. Every one of these must have brought back a pang, Petersburg. Petersburg, how he had suffered in body and in mind over its people. How he had been tortured that night when he had been compelled to turn his back on them and leave them, their women and their children, to the mercy of the Federals, whose challenging guns had followed him over the same Appomattox to which he now had come. The brakes were grinding, the train was stopping, it was Pocahontas, a scattered settlement on the north bank of the river. The moment the wheels ceased turning there came a crash of sound, music, a band, the notes of the Marseillaise. The performers had come over to do him honor and had been waiting in the station. They played through the French anthem the southern soldiers had loved and then they climbed aboard the train. Slowly over the river and through the town the train was pulled to the Washington Street station, which was crowded. The windows of Jarrett's hotel nearby and the streets and roadway around it were jammed. People started cheering the moment General Lee appeared, and they opened their applauding, smiling ranks as he walked to the curb, where his host, General William Mahone, had a carriage with four white horses awaiting him. Around the vehicle surged the throng, acclaiming him, rejoicing to see once more the man whose thin line had so long kept their city safe. The final defeat was forgotten in the memory of the victories won against odds so commanding. Some of the men wished to take the horses from the traces and to drag the carriage themselves, but Lee insisted that if they did this, he would have to get out and help them, so they desisted. The band began to play again, tune after tune beloved of the South, but its notes were almost drowned in the applauding roar of the multitude. The crowd would not let the carriage continue on its way until the general had risen in his seat, had taken off his hat, and had bowed to his well-wishers. This first phase of his reception must have relieved him, very different were these smiling, appreciative, and confident people from the pinched victims of disaster he had been picturing to himself half an hour before. With them the war was over, and they had buried most of its sorrows. Upon his arrival at the Mahone residence, on the corner of Sycamore and Marshall Streets, the general found a note from Miss Balling, in which she invited him to call on her that afternoon. It was not for him to refuse so gentle a request. Promptly and gallantly he went across the street to Mr. Balling's home, Poplar Lawn, nearly opposite the park where the Federal wounded from the Battle of the Crater had been brought. Ushered in, he saw the majestic young lady in the full flush of the excitement that preceded the wedding, and he presented her a necklace that Mrs. Lee and he had chosen. The bride-to-be was pleased to express her delight with it. Then, for memory's sake and old affection, Lee went to Chelsea, the Bannister home, where on his Sunday visits during the siege he had eaten many a Spartan dinner. Those of the family who had survived the horrors of the war were there to greet him, among them in Bannister, who was now sixteen and very lovely to behold. Remember, my dear, Lee said to her, after he had chatted a while, I am to have the honor of taking you in to supper. Ask your escort to lend you to me. Your aunt, Mrs. Balling, is sick and will not come down, so I want to take you in." And danced for joy. Three hours before the time set for the ceremony, the good people of Petersburg began to gather at the church, more perhaps to see General Lee than to witness the ceremony, though that was draped with all the dignity the proud city could command. The crowd far overflowed the edifice and thronged the street. At last the guests began to arrive, first of all, General Lee in his new broadcloth suit, escorting Mrs. Carr. 
In the doorway, he stooped for a moment to kiss a little girl who smiled up at him. Behind General Lee were General and Mrs. Mahone. Presently came Miss Balling and her ten bridesmaids. A like number of the friends of Rooney were at hand to support him in his happy ordeal. It was a gathering of the Lee clan, for besides the General, the Groom, and Mildred, there were in attendance Custis, Robert, and Fitz Lee, the nephew. Nearly all the notables of that part of Virginia were present, also. President Davis himself would have been a spectator, but for the death of his mother-in-law, Mrs. Howell. After the wedding came the supper, in the most lavish style of the old Dominion. And Bannister was there, true to her commitment, and proudly entered the dining room on the arm of General Lee. Doubtless her pride was heightened by the fact that she wore a long dress for the very first time. Dutifully the next morning, before any of the Mahones had descended to breakfast, the general penned a lengthy letter to his wife. He described the happy event to her, as fully as a man could be expected to do, though he did not essay the precious details of the apparel of the bride and her maids. All he could say to satisfy the curiosity of Mrs. Lee and the stay-at-homes was the vague and masculine, the bride looked lovely, and was in every way captivating. Mildred was all life, in white and curls. The morning meal completed, Lee went on an odd mission. While he had maintained his headquarters at the Turnbull House, an old woman of the neighborhood had frequently sent him eggs and butter in a time of universal want. He had not forgotten her, and now that he was back in Petersburg he went to call on her. It must have cost him an effort, even after the welcome the city had given him, for there at Turnbull's the heartbreaking crisis of April 2, 1865, had begun. The house itself was gone, destroyed by fire that fatal morning, but all around were the ghastly reminders of the siege, the chevaux de frise scarcely rotted away, the earthworks grim and red, and not yet softened in line by crabgrass or ragweed. Back from this visit, he lunched with the bowlings. They had passed word that their friends might call on the general that afternoon, and those who revered him came by scores. In the evening an affair was given in honor of the bride at the home of William R. Johnson, who resided on the corner of Washington and Davis Streets. The general attended, he did not absent himself from any of the entertainments, and he seemed to enjoy himself greatly. He was delighted, his son recorded, to find the people so prosperous, and to observe that they had it in their hearts to be gay and happy. Everyone knew, apparently, that the general was to journey back to Richmond on Saturday, November 30th. As he went to the station they crowded the highways of Petersburg once again to bid him farewell. The train conveying him to Richmond pulled out amid a roar of cheers. He was as loath to go as he had been unwilling to come. In consequence of being told that the new couple were to leave Petersburg the morning after the wedding, I had made my arrangements to return to Richmond Saturday. If I had known that they would remain till Monday, as it is now their intention, I should have made my arrangements to stay, thus he wrote Mrs. Lee after he had reached Richmond. Custis, Robert, and Fitzley journeyed back with him to his old capital. After they had their supper at the hotel, the general started out to make some calls on old friends. He took Robert with him and made a wide circuit, Mrs. Caskey's, where both the elders were sick Abed, Mrs. Triplett's, Mrs. Peebles, Mrs. Branders, Mrs. J. R. Anderson's. There were many others he went to see, Robert wrote, for I remember going with him. He sat only a few minutes at each place, called just to shake hands, he would say. All were delighted to see him. From some places where he was well known he could hardly get away. He had a kind word for all, and his excuse for hurrying on was that he must try to see so and so, as Mrs. Lee had told him to be sure to do so. He was bright and cheerful, and was pleased with the great affection shown him on all sides. He spent Sunday quietly in Richmond, it was a cold day with much ice and evidence, and on the morning of December 2nd, with Custis and Robert he went down James River to Brendan, home of his cousins, the Harrisons. In all his years he had never been to that gracious mansion, and as he had promised at the Rockbridge Baths in 1865 to visit the place the next time he came to Richmond, he took this opportunity. The brief voyage carried him down the channel between Drury's and Chaffin's Bluff and past City Point, where Grant had headquarters for nearly ten months. But Lee did not talk of war, and apparently he made an effort to avoid thinking of it. He did not converse much, and what he had to say to his sons dealt with the old river plantations, places dear to him from many associations. 
I passed Shirley twice, with a heavy heart, he subsequently wrote Hill Carter. I took a long look each time at the house, the grounds and the farm from the hurricane deck of the steamer, hoping to see some of the family to no purpose. I thought if I could only see your white eyebrows as our Uncle Randolph described them, I would have been content. An all-too-brief night and part of a day were pleasantly passed at Brandon. Then he came back to Richmond by steamer, spent Thursday, December 5th, at Hickory Hill, the Wickham home in Hanover County, and on December 6th started for home, which he reached on December 7th. He had missed two faculty meetings in succession, but he was at his post again on December 9th. It was the longest absence from college Lee thus far had allowed himself during the session, and it marked a definite transition in his state of mind. He was far happier after this visit and more willing to travel and to mingle with his people again. Prior to the journey to Petersburg he had been oppressed by the poverty, losses, and misery of the southern people. He had traveled little after he had come to Lexington and he did not know how the South was reviving or in what spirit it was adjusting itself to the Reconstruction. To the Marquis of Lorne he had said that it would be many years before the South could recover and he had daily carried its sorrows on his heart. Then, almost overnight, he found himself in a new atmosphere. Instead of distress, idleness, and vain regret, he found good cheer, industry, and a courageous acceptance of the outcome of the war, along with a pride in the old cause and affection for those who had led it. The people were not sitting in the ashes, lamenting their losses and bewailing their subjection to military rule. Rather were they rebuilding the wastes, accepting the inevitable with patient courage, and exhibiting the very quality that Lee had praised in writing to A. M. Kale, a Petersburg man, the determination not to be turned aside by thoughts of the past and fears of the future. Lee saw all this and in a self-revealing passage of a letter to Rooney gave expression to a sense of relief that was reflected in all his correspondence and counsel thereafter. My visit to Petersburg was extremely pleasant. Besides the pleasure of seeing my daughter and being with you, which was very great, I was gratified in seeing many friends. In addition, when our armies were in front of Petersburg, I suffered so much in body and mind on account of the good townspeople, especially on that gloomy night when I was forced to abandon them, that I have always reverted to them in sadness and sorrow. My old feelings returned to me, as I passed well-remembered spots and recalled the ravages of the hostile shells. But when I saw the cheerfulness with which the people were working to restore their condition, and witnessed the comforts with which they were surrounded, a load of sorrow which had been pressing upon me for years was lifted from my heart. Chapter 20 The Johnston Affair and Old Animosities The college, meantime, had opened auspiciously and uneventfully for the session of 18671868, with an enrollment that exceeded 400 by October 4 and climbed before June to a total of 410, 11 more than had been registered the previous session, and nearly three times as many as in 18651866. Attendance from Virginia and from Tennessee was slightly lower than during the term preceding, but there were more boys from other states, of which 18 were represented. All the former professors were again in service, reinforced by a number of young assistants. As in 1866, the full membership of the faculty, including the president, was 22. Lee was kept busy with his administrative duties, which continued so heavy that he protested every absence from his office involved an accumulation of work. Agnes and Mary were both away in Maryland for the greater part of the winter. Mildred, the one-time absentee, not only kept house, but had in addition the care of another Mildred, daughter of General Lee's brother, Charles Carter Lee. To distinguish his daughter from this little niece, who had come to Lexington to go to school, General Lee dubbed the younger Mildred Powhatty, after the name of her native country. Besides Powhatty, two of her brothers, the general's nephews, took their meals with the family that winter while rooming elsewhere and attending college. Custis continued to live with his parents and taught in the Virginia Military Institute adjoining the college. Mildred took seriously the management of this sizable household and ruled with an autocracy that amused her father. Life has it all her own way now, the general wrote Robert in January, 1868, and expends her energy in regulating her brother and putting your mother's drawers and presses to rights. To his new daughter-in-law he confided that Mildred has had her hands full and considers herself now a great character. She rules her brother and my nephews with an iron rod and scatters her advice broadcast among the young men of the college. I hope that it may yield an abundant harvest. 
the young mothers of Lexington ought to be extremely grateful to her for her suggestions to them as to the proper mode of rearing their children, and though she finds many unable to appreciate her system, she is nothing daunted by their obtuseness of vision, but takes advantage of every opportunity to enlighten them as to its benefits. Mildred was so busy that she had little time to go out with the general, who consequently had to take his exercise alone. My only pleasure, he wrote Mrs. Rooney Lee, is in my solitary evening rides, which give me abundant opportunity for quiet thought. Christmas passed quietly, with Robert up from Tidewater for the season. January opened sadly for Lee. For a time, a brief time fortunately, he lost some of the cheerfulness he had gleaned from the Petersburg visit. My interest in time and its concerns, he wrote, is daily fading away and I try to keep my eyes and thoughts fixed on those eternal shores to which I am fast hastening. The gloom of a dark, wet winter was deepened early by the most unpleasant happening of General Lee's entire administration of the college. On North River, flowing directly by Lexington, there was a dam, above which was a long stretch that froze readily and afforded excellent skating in cold weather. Students and townspeople thronged it. On the afternoon of February 4, one E. C. Johnston, a former federal soldier, went down to the river to enjoy the ice. He had come to Lexington in the autumn of 1865 as an agent of the American Missionary Association and had established some schools for the instruction of freedmen. From this work, apparently, he had turned to storekeeping, but his affiliations with the Negroes made him somewhat notorious and distinctly unpopular. He was accustomed to carry a pistol and had it with him that day, explaining later that he did so at the instance of friends who considered his life in danger. Soon after Johnston got on the ice he noticed that other skaters shunned him. So he determined to skate down the river, away from those who objected to his presence. He went on for something more than a mile and then, turning a bend, came in view of a crowd that included town boys of various ages and a number of students from the college. Some of them knew the reputation of Johnston as one who consorted with the blacks, and they commenced to hoot and to yell at him, just as the rebels used to yell when making a charge in the army, Johnston subsequently narrated. The object of this contempt skated past the crowd, without a word on his part or any act of violence on theirs. He went on to the dam, where he rested a while, in sight of the young men, and then he started back up the river. His tormentors resumed their jibes at once, as boys always will, when they see their victim is harassed. Johnston kept on toward them, swinging from side to side of the river. At one crossing, a lad of about twelve came close to him and hurled the most insulting of epithets at him. Then Johnston lost his head. He caught hold of the youngster, drew his pistol, and threatened to shoot him if he repeated the words. The boy's older brother, and probably some others, came up immediately. Johnston thereupon released his grip and started off, pursued by the crowd, which began to abuse him hotly. The northerner foolishly tried to dispute with them and thereby sharpened their language. In the excitement, some of the youths cried, hang him and drown him. According to one version of the affair, Johnston was told he had to leave town within ten days, and was warned that if he said anything about the affair, the townsmen would come to his store and lynch him. He finally got off the river. Pelted with ice and clods as he went away, he reached shelter and safety, with sundry bruises and bumps, but with no serious injuries to show for his misadventure. That night a group unidentified men, in disputed numbers, one version says five, Johnston insisted it was a crowd, came to his place of business, beat upon the door, rattled the shutters, and shouted insults. After a while, arousing no one, they went away. Johnston, as it happened, was not in the building at the time. If General heard anything of the episode, it probably was no more than that a northern radical had drawn a pistol on a little boy and had been driven from the ice. And that was the way the college community looked at it. Johnston, however, was out for revenge. He went forthwith to the mayor of the town, J. M. Ruff, and gave him his version of the affair, insisting that the boy who insulted him was at least sixteen or seventeen years old. His assumption apparently was that all those he had encountered on the river were students. He demanded protection and called upon the mayor to punish the guilty. In the absence of specific charges against any named student, the mayor told Johnston that he could not control the college boys. Johnston then reported the matter to the military authorities. 
Word of it reached Brigadier General Douglas Fraser, the Assistant Military Commissioner of the district. He, too, went to see the mayor and came away with an exaggerated picture of the lawlessness of the students. General Fraser thereupon communicated with his superior, Brevet Major General O. B. Wilcox, commanding the sub-district of Lynchburg. General Wilcox came at once to Lexington and investigated. He talked with Johnston and with various witnesses to the affray, and also with the mayor, whom he thought lacking in energy and determination but, well disposed. Then he went to see General Lee and, for the first time, acquainted him with the fact that Johnston considered he had been insulted by members of the student body because he was a northerner. General Wilcox supplied the names of three students who were alleged to have been involved. General Lee expressed his deep regret and immediately began an inquiry into the facts. Finding that two of the accused boys had been engaged in the affair, he directed one of them to withdraw immediately and wrote the parents of the other to remove him from college. The third young man, who had been present but had not participated in the row, applied for permission to leave the institution and was allowed to do so. This action was taken by General Lee without calling the faculty together and while General Wilcox was still in town. It was coupled with assurance to the federal commander that he would expel any student guilty of disorderly conduct. General Wilcox went back to Lynchburg well satisfied. Mr. Johnston is partly to blame himself, he reported, as he threatened to shoot one of the small boys when they first set on him. As Johnston had not complained of any particular person to the mayor he had made no arrests or other progress in the case, the parties being wholly unknown, but I saw no signs of any disposition to screen disturbers of the peace. A few days after General Wilcox's departure, word was alleged to have been sent to Johnston that he had better leave town, as the students were preparing to give him a calathumps. The northerner had already planned to remove his business elsewhere and he soon departed for Covington. Here the matter might have ended, but for the feeling of Johnston and some of his friends that he had been badly treated. They endeavored to strike back, at General Lee, at the school and at General Wilcox, whose refusal to take extreme measures had incensed them. Washington College that winter had boldly launched in the North a promising campaign for financial support. Rev. E. P. Walton had charge of the solicitation and tactfully prevailed upon more than 30 New Yorkers of prominence to unite in a call for a meeting on the evening of March 3 in the Principal Hall of Cooper Institute. The signers included Henry Ward Beecher, Bishop Potter, Charles F. Deems, W. E. Dodge, Peter Cooper, and A. A. Lowe. Despite inclement weather, the assemblage included some 500 persons. It was one of the first gatherings that came together in the North after the war to assist a Southern college directed by former Confederates, and for that reason its proceedings have a place not only in the life of Lee but also in the history of Southern education. Officers for the meeting were chosen and letters were read from a number of prominent people who expressed their willingness to help. Among them was Governor R. E. Fenton, James T. Brady, a lawyer who appeared in the case of Jefferson Davis, Horace Greeley, Garrett Smith, and George William Curtis. Governor Fenton expressed his pleasure that practical business education was to be given in Southern colleges. I need not say, he wrote Mr. Walton, that I sympathize with the patriotic and benevolent features of the institution which you represent. Garrett Smith's letter contained a check for $200 for the Lexington School. I wish our wealthy men of the North could give that college a couple of hundred thousand, he wrote, and went on, sufficient cause why the North should give large help to the South is that the one is rich and the other poor. But the South is a sinner, say thousands. True, she is, but sinners should be helped as well as saints. What, however, is the North but her fellow sinner? England cursed us both with slavery. Then we cursed ourselves with it, the North as well as the South upholding it. And then came on the war. The South, no less brave than the North, yet being by far the weaker party, fell under. Now it only remains for us to forgive each other, to love each other, and to do all the good we can to each other. So shall we become a united people, and, profiting by our great mistakes in the past, we shall enter upon a new and happy national life. George William Curtis wrote, I should most gladly do anything in my power to show that the most radical men in this part of the country cherish no unkind, much less any vindictive feeling, toward the people of any state or section as a class, and that the true radical policy is merely the security of fair play and equal opportunities for all. 
prompt and universal education in the southern states is the truest and most enduring reconstruction. Every word spoken for it, every dollar given to it, is the sincerest peace offering. After the letters had been read, Henry Ward Beecher introduced a series of resolutions, one of which is as applicable now as it was in 1868. It was this. Resolved, that while we rejoice in the earnest labor which has lately been bestowed upon the primary education of the most ignorant classes of the South, we believe that this labor should be accompanied with equal zeal for the instruction in the higher walks of learning, so that the college may furnish an abundant supply of teachers for the people and by its example of higher education continually raise the standard and ideal of the common school. Then Professor Roswell Dwight Hitchcock of New York Union Theological Seminary addressed the audience. Washington College, he said, was doing a noble work and required aid. The cause of education in the South appeals not to the prejudices of men but to the patriotism of the people. Of General Lee, who led the armies of the rebellion, he could only speak as of a brave man who, when he found that the cause he had espoused was a lost one at Appomattox Courthouse, behaved himself as a gentleman and a Christian. Of Robert E. Lee he could say that since the war he had acted the part of the gentleman, the patriot, and the scholar, sedulously keeping himself secluded from the public gaze and laboring now at the head of the institution, he was entitled to all honor. Henry Ward Beecher closed the meeting with a characteristic speech in which he urged the cause of education. He pleaded for Washington College, because it was in Virginia and because Lee was its president. He would not withhold his support from any Southern school, but for this one his sympathies were strong. No one regretted the course which General Lee had chosen in former days more than he, the Speaker, did. But if he had been born in Virginia, brought up amid her institutions, educated in a southern college, he might have been prompted to take a course just as bad or erratic as did Lee or Johnston. Lee was now pleading for mental bread for his students. Whatever his error in war, Lee had now devoted himself to the sacred cause of education. Did men ask if Lee might not pervert the minds of youth? No! Lee would not fail to instill patriotism and love of country in the minds of all his students. Mr. Beecher spoke with great earnestness and was much applauded. Apparently, no collection was taken before adjournment, but the meeting was altogether as good an introduction to the people of New York as could have been asked. If it had been followed by similar endorsements from a few other leading men of the North, it might have meant much to Washington College. The gathering, however, aroused the wrath of some of the old abolitionists who at that time knew nothing of the Johnston incident. The New York Independent of March 12 made the rally at Cooper Institute the text for an editorial article on education at the South. It was the duty of the North to forget all ill will and to help the South in education, but when it came to supporting a college of which the late commander of the Confederate Army is the president, we must respectfully decline. The Independent went on in this strain. We do not think that a man who broke his solemn oath of allegiance to the United States, who imbrued his hands in the blood of tens of thousands of his country's noblest men, for the purpose of perpetuating human slavery, and who is largely responsible for the cruelties and horrors of Libby, Salisbury and Andersonville, is fitted to be a teacher of young men. At this point in the article, an asterisk was inserted and a footnote added to this effect. We have been reminded, since this article was in type, that the last thing which General Lee did, as an officer of the American Army, was to hold an interview with General Scott at his request, and, when General Scott, trusting to his loyalty, showed him his maps and drawings of the defenses of Washington, he took them with him to Arlington, upon the pretense that he wished to examine them more particularly and then, without returning them, went over to the rebel side. We have also been reminded of the fact that slaves found on his plantation at Arlington averred that he had treated them with atrocious cruelty. Such a man, the article continued, must give evidence of repentance and some guarantee that students would not be taught to honor and imitate his example. We wish to be assured, moreover, before contributing money to General Lee's College or any other similar institution at the South, that it does not tolerate the hellborn spirit of caste by turning from its doors students of a dark complexion. After more in this tone, the Independent proceeded to show what it was pleased to call the spirit that prevails in General Lee's college by quoting the following from a letter written by a loyal clergyman of Tennessee. In passing over the East Tennessee and Virginia Railroad, I occasionally meet with young men dressed in a singular uniform. 
Upon inquiry, they tell you they belong to General Lee's school at Lexington, Virginia. I remarked on one occasion that I was not aware that that institution was a military school. Oh. Well, it isn't exactly. But we wear uniforms and drill, was the reply. What do you call your uniform? Officers Gray. Do you like it? Yes, we won't have anything else. We won't wear the D, D Yankee blue at General Lee's school. Is this the sort of college to which the Christian loyalists of the North should make contributions? Indignantly asked the Independent, wholly unconscious that the Virginia Military Institute, as well as Washington College, was located at Lexington, and that some of the uniformed cadets of the Institute evidently had been joking with the worthy loyal clergymen of Tennessee. Not content with the testimony of one minister, the Independent quoted another, who had written in a letter. As I told you before, it is out of the question for our children to go in any peace to the rebel schools. They are neglected, insulted, and finally driven out of the school, and we want to have a position where they can be treated as they deserve. On this the Independent commented, is there any evidence that Washington College, under the presidency of General Lee, is anything else than a rebel school, in which a loyal student would be subjected to insult and persecution? The Friends of Freedom at the North will be likely, we think, to demand an answer to this question before contributing to its support. If believers in education wanted to promote that cause in the South, let them help Berea College, Kentucky, where instruction was given last year, to more than 300 students, of whom something over half are colored, the most advanced class in the South. When the issue containing this article reached Lexington, one of Johnston's friends, who signed himself a resident of Lexington, wrote a very bitter letter to the periodical, instancing the treatment of that young man as further proof of what the Independent had charged. The letter began in this fashion. Residing in Lexington, and having seen more or less of the students and professors of Washington College daily since Lee assumed the presidency of the institution, I feel it my duty to give to the people a few facts, which will, I trust, show the philanthropists of the North the animus of the institution to which they are contributing. The professors are, without a single exception, thoroughly rebel in sentiment, and act accordingly. No student can remain in the college who is not a rebel, not, I suppose, from any law of the institution to that effect, but from the universal sentiment of those connected with the school. Then followed a partisan view of Johnston's encounter and of his efforts to procure redress. The Independent printed with this a statement that as efforts were being made in the North to collect money for Washington College, it felt called to print the letter, showing how rampant is the spirit of rebellion, prescription and mobocratic violence in that institution. The editor appended to the communication a paragraph in kindred spirit, in view of facts like these, which come to us from a responsible source, we should think that every man who has given assent to General Lee's college would see and feel that he has been imposed upon, and that his money has been worse than thrown away. In the same issue appeared an article by William Lloyd Garrison, protesting against donations to Washington College. What of the patriotism of General Lee or Washington College, he demanded. Is the vanquished leader of the rebel armies now a patriot or disposed to teach the rebel sons of rebel parents lessons of patriotism? Who is more dumb or, apparently, more obdurate than himself? He at the head of a patriotic institution, teaching loyalty to the Constitution and the duty of maintaining that union which he so lately attempted to destroy. The incidents related by the resident of Lexington and those quoted in the Independent were exceedingly bad advertising for the college in the eyes of those who knew nothing of the facts. In another letter, which the Independent printed on April 16, 1868, more of the same sort of publicity was given. This was written by Miss J. A. Shearman, a northern woman, who recounted how she had gone south to teach school in the fall of 1865, with a heart full of forgiving pity and yearning sympathy. She was soon disillusioned, she said. My first year in the South took me to Lexington, Virginia. I traveled one entire day in the company of General Lee and, being confirmed by his external deportment in my preconceived belief that he was what the world is accustomed to call a gentleman, I took heart as regards my novel position. My first excursion in Lexington, which was simply to a hardware store on a shopping errand, was the occasion of my first insult from the students of Washington College. A group of them followed me into the store and then beckoned to their comrades outside to come and take a look at the Yankees at the price of 25 cents a look. 
I wrote to General Lee, saying that I had come there with kind and peaceable intentions, that it was my purpose to conduct myself as a lady, and that, while I did so, I claimed the right to be treated as such. To this I received no reply, and I soon decided that to expect protection from that quarter would be vain. Thenceforth I met every insult in silence and patience. Never did I walk the streets of Lexington without rudeness, in one form or another. Ladies glorified in compelling the Yankee woman, in her good nature, to step into the mud for their accommodation, the boys of the aristocratic school of the place hooted every time I passed them, and the students sneered and cursed alternately. From one set of students, whose boarding house I was compelled constantly to pass, I habitually read the polite salutation of Yankee, of a nigger teacher, with the occasional addition of an admonition to take up my abode in the infernal regions. I have been awakened from my sleep, in the dead of night, by horrible serenades, performed under my window, by these same gentlemanly young men. I have taught an evening school while brickbats were being thrown by them at the window. And, finally, I came near being driven out, with my companions, in consequence of a statement, made by the ex-mayor of the place, that the students were planning to burn the school property in which we were living. It would have been hard for General Lee to have combated hostility to the college based on his failure to answer the complaint of an unknown woman that she had been ridiculed in a Lexington hardware store by unidentified young men whom she took to be students of Washington College. Fortunately for the college, however, its anonymous critic, the resident of Lexington, had trod on the toes of General Wilcox and had hinted that the federal commander had been much too lenient in the Johnston case. This aroused L., one of Wilcox's admirers, L., probably Captain Lacey of his staff, who had accompanied him to Lexington in February. This officer wrote the New York Tribune a correct account of the affair, which the Independent had the grace to reproduce. This correction, wrote L., will, I trust, be sufficient to exonerate General Lee, but for whom and the cause of education, so essential to the welfare of the South, I should not notice the letter and article referred to. As to the slur which was sought to be cast upon General Wilcox in the letter for consulting with Lee and other notable rebels, instead of making military arrests, his duty and orders first required him to confer with and demand redress at the hands of town and college authorities, and, as always done that could be properly demanded, and military interference was called for. I can assure you that General Wilcox is not the man to slight his duty, or to refuse redress and protection when required, and, in this case, where the offenders were promptly punished by General Lee, and where the attack on the part of the boys was invited by Johnston's threat of shooting a little boy, and the presentation of pistol, he does not, certainly, deserve censure for not further prosecuting it. No further complaints have been received from Lexington, which is as quiet as any college town in the United States. Johnston saw this letter, after he had taken up his residence in Covington, and he returned to the charge in a long argumentative communication to the Independent. He denied that proper efforts had been made to identify the boys who had attacked him. The Tribune correspondent, he went on, says three have been expelled. Now I don't know, but they have. But this I do know, that every time I have been in Lexington since that time I have seen some students going to and from college who were foremost in the riot, and why are they not expelled? Not merely because I could not identify them, for General Lee kept the matter in his own hands, and I was not allowed an opportunity to identify them, for reasons known to himself, I suppose. At that time examinations were going on at the college, and some were being expelled because they could not pass examination, sick. Is it possible that these three were of the number that could not pass examination? Again, he argued, in the latter part of his letter, the Tribune correspondent says Lexington is as quiet as any college town in the United States. I have been in a good many college towns, and I have never been in a place where the students were in the habit of getting drunk and going through the town, two or three nights a week, firing pistols and threatening to shoot people, and this certainly is the case in Lexington. He aimed his parting blow at the college, the following will show you how much they regard Mr. Beecher. A few days since, a gentleman stepped into the office of one of the trustees with a check of $5,000 from Northern Men to get the signature of the trustee upon it. This remark was made, why, this is from Beecher's party, isn't it? Well, if Beecher and the devil were to draw straws, I don't know who would get the longest. Well, but we are getting money from them, said he with the check. Yes, was the reply, their money is as good as anybody's, I suppose. This is a fact which cannot be controverted. 
While Johnston's final defense apparently did not circulate beyond the columns of The Independent, the first letter from Lexington and the accompanying editorial comment of the periodical were copied widely. Other publications joined in denunciation of the college. Among others, the Yale College Weekly, The Courant, reproduced the initial article from The Independent. Until that time General Lee had taken no notice of the attacks, no doubt feeling it was futile to argue with publications that printed absurd lies as sober fact, but he did write the New Haven paper. I regret, said he, that such an accusation against any literary institution in the country should have been copied in the Yale Courant. The statements of the resident of Lexington have been repeatedly denied, and I had hoped that a letter from an officer of the army, published in the New York Tribune of April 20th, would have satisfied all fair-minded persons of their injustice. As it gives all the facts in the case, and will have more weight than anything I could say, I enclose a slip from the Lexington Gazette, which republished it. Very respectfully, your obedient servant. The Courant promptly and generously made the Almond honorable. Similar letters were written several individuals who inquired directly of Lee for the facts in the case. Mr. Walton got pledges in cash amounting to $4,300 in New York, including $1,000 from Henry Ward Beecher, Garrett Smith's $200, and $100 each from John A. Griscom, Samuel J. Tilden, and J. S. W. McCullough. But it is quite likely that the vehemence of the attacks prompted the college to withdraw its agent and to abandon the canvas. The agitation exhibits, moreover, one reason why General Lee avoided all public appearances and every act that might lead to controversy. The temper of the times was not suited to cooperation between North and South. Every effort to that end, no matter how honestly planned or how sincerely undertaken, was certain to spur extremists, North and South. Before the Johnston affair had been forgotten, there came another episode that might easily have had troublesome results. In an altercation one Friday evening, May 8, 1868, near the gate leading to his home, Francis H. Brockenbrough, a younger son of Judge Brockenbrough, was shot by a Negro youth named Caesar Griffin. The injury did not result from any organized clash nor did it concern the college directly, for Francis was too young to be a student there, though two of his brothers were. But as the boys wound threatened to cause his death, excitement was high. The students organized a manhunt, and when the Negro was found, they put a rope around his neck and marched him to the courthouse square. Some spectators thought they intended to lynch him then and there, but that was not their intention. At General Lee's instance, they turned the miscreant over to the officers of the law and went back up the hill to college. Two days later a rumor got afloat that the students intended to storm the jail and to kill the black in case young Brockenbrough died. This rumor came to the ears of the military commissioner of Lexington, Lt. Jacob Wagner of the 29th Infantry, and he passed it on to General Lee. The general not infrequently received complaints which some of his friends thought were preferred against the students by people seeking notoriety, but whenever these were officially presented, he always investigated them. In this instance, as the day was Sunday and the academic body was scattered, the only way the general could reach the boys was through the YMCA. So he immediately wrote the president of that organization, a former captain in the Confederate Army, telling him of the commissioner's apprehension. Lee expressed his confidence that the students contemplated no such action as Wagner feared, but he concluded, I earnestly invoke the students to abstain from any violation of law and to unite in preserving quiet and order on this and every occasion. Finding the next day that there was no foundation for the report that the college boys planned to lynch the Negro, General Lee so advised Lt. Wagner. But that officer had become alarmed for the good order of the town under his charge and at some stage of the affair called on General Wilcox for troops. A company arrived promptly, but this patrol of the streets did not relieve the commissioner's concern. He feared the soldiers were so few in number that a conflict with the citizens was likely, and he appealed for reinforcements. General Wilcox was cooler and more experienced and decided to wait for further demonstration before putting more armed men into the town. His judgment was vindicated. In a short while order was fully restored, without any violence beyond that of language and the harmless discharge of a few pistols in the air. Fortunately, the college was not hurt by this incident, which, however, became historic. 
Caesar Griffin was tried before Judge Hugh W. Sheffy in the Circuit Court of Rockbridge County at the November term, 1868, and as Francis Brockenborough had recovered by that time, the assailant was given a penitentiary term of only two years. Federal Judge J. C. Underwood forthwith issued a writ of habeas corpus and soon released the culprit on the grounds that Sheffy was not a duly constituted judge but a mere usurper and that there was, in reality, no legal machinery for the punishment of crime in Virginia. This was a virtual declaration of anarchy and might have had the direst consequences had not General Bradley Johnson interested Judge Salmon Chase in the situation. The Chief Justice came to Richmond, heard the case in the United States Circuit Court in May, 1869, and promptly reversed Underwood. A third unpleasant occurrence took place that winter. In time, it antedated the others. In importance, it ranked below them. The Senate of the United States had before it the credentials of Philip F. Thomas, duly elected junior senator from Maryland. Thomas had been Secretary of the Treasury during part of the administration of Buchanan and had been accused by the radicals of consorting with traitors on the eve of the war. He also had a son in the Confederate Army. His admission to the Senate was challenged for these reasons. On February 19, 1868, when the resolution to seat Thomas was about to come to a vote, Reverdy Johnson, the other senator from Maryland, made a final appeal for his colleague. In the course of his argument, he contended that attempts at compromise and official failure to take extreme measures early in 1861 did not constitute treason or display sympathy with rebellion, as was alleged against Thomas. Instancing Senator Cameron, who had been Secretary of War at the beginning of Lincoln's first term, Johnson maintained that Cameron's action in not arresting Lee when he came to tender his resignation did not carry with it any imputation of disloyalty on the Secretary's part. Cameron, who was slow to understand what Johnson was talking about, at length explained the circumstances of Lee's resignation as he understood them. I will tell you why he was not arrested, said he. General Lee called on a gentleman who had my entire confidence and intimated that he would like to have the command of the army. He assured that gentleman, who was a man in the confidence of the administration, of his entire loyalty and his devotion to the interests of the administration and of the country. I consulted with General Scott, and General Scott approved of placing him at the head of the army. The place was offered to him unofficially, with my approbation, and with the approbation of General Scott. It was accepted by him verbally, with the promise that he would go into Virginia and settle his business and then come back to take command. He never gave us an opportunity to arrest him, he deserted under false pretenses. Johnson inquired, Did I understand the honorable member to say that General Lee made the statement which he now mentions to him, or that he got it through a third party? Through a gentleman who had my confidence and in whom I relied entirely. That is another matter, Johnson insisted. The statement was not made to the honorable member. I have no doubt of its truth, Cameron retorted. That I am equally sure of, said the Marylanda, but I doubt very much its truth. It is not in keeping with the character of Lee. At this point he was interrupted by laughter, led by Senator Connus of California. Johnson fired. Gentlemen may laugh, he retorted, but I say to the honorable member from California, who indulges in merriment, that General Lee is as honorable a man as any man to be found in the state of California. He has offended, that I admit. The argument veered away from Lee and ended presently in a vote to refuse to seat Thomas. Cameron's charge, which of course went into the record, soon came to General Lee's eyes. Never did he reply to attacks on his strategy or on his conduct of campaigns. He had ceased to answer the oft-repeated old lie that he had been cruel to the Arlington Negroes. But Cameron's allegation, like the charge that he starved prisoners of war, Lee regarded as a reflection on his personal honor, and he met it on February 25th in a letter he wrote Senator Johnson. This read as follows. My attention has been called to the official report of the debate in the Senate of the United States on the 19th instant in which you did me the kindness to doubt the correctness of the statement made by Honorable Simon Cameron in regard to myself. I desire that you may feel certain of my conduct on the occasion referred to, so far as my individual statement can make you. 
I never intimated to anyone that I desired the command of the United States Army, nor did I ever have a conversation with but one gentleman, Mr. Francis Preston Blair, on the subject, which was at his invitation, and, I understood, at the instance of President Lincoln. After listening to his remarks, I declined the offer he made me to take command of the army that was to be brought into the field, stating, as candidly and as courteously as I could, that, though opposed to secession and deprecating war, I could take no part in an invasion of the southern states. I went directly from the interview with Mr. Blair to the office of General Scott, told him of the proposition that had been made to me, and my decision. Upon reflection after returning to my home, I concluded that I ought no longer to retain the commission I held in the United States Army, and on the second morning thereafter I forwarded my resignation to General Scott. At the time, I hoped that peace would have been preserved, that some way would have been found to save the country from the calamities of war, and I then had no other intention than to pass the remainder of my life as a private citizen. Two days afterwards, upon the invitation of the Governor of Virginia, I repaired to Richmond, found that the convention then in session had passed the ordinance withdrawing the state from the Union, and accepted the commission of commander of its forces, which was tendered me. These are the ample, simple, facts of the case, and they show that Mr. Cameron has been misinformed. He never again wrote of the details of his resignation from the army. The hard, wet winter that had just ended at the time of the Brockenburg shooting was accompanied by much sickness in Lexington. Two of the cadets of the V.M.I. died of pneumonia. Mrs. Lee suffered more than usual, and Powhatty did not escape. The general took such exercise as he could get, and he found much satisfaction, one March day, in following the plows of a neighboring farmer around the circuit of his fields. He caught cold, however, and had to admit, when the rough weather was past, that he had not been as well, as usual, but he still delighted in his occasional rides of traveler. The depression of January vanished, he had pleasure in his work. I much enjoy the charms of civil life, he wrote General Ewell about this time, and find too late that I have wasted the best years of my existence. Perhaps the prospect that detracted most from the charms of civil life was the approaching trial of President Davis. Going to Richmond as an unwilling witness in the proceedings was a painful errand for General Lee, even though it held out the prospect of meeting with his sons. To Agnes, who had seen Mr. Davis as he passed through Baltimore, Lee wrote, It is a terrible thing to have the prosecution hanging over him, and to be unable to fix his thoughts on a course of life or apply his hands to the support of his family. But I hope a kind providence will shield and guide him. As the time for the expected trial drew on, his tone was even more serious. God grant, said he, that, like the impeachment of Mr. Johnson, it may be dismissed. On May 1, 1868, Lee went to Richmond, under summons, only to find the proceedings deferred until June. He took advantage of his proximity to his sons and paid them a brief visit. The coming of spring had already awakened the general's love of agriculture and had increased his faith in the South's recovery through hard labor, particularly by the men who had fought sterner battles. Work is what we now require, he had written Hill Carter in earnest strain, work by everybody and work especially by white hands. Labor and economy will carry us through. We must spend less than we formerly did. We require very little and we must use that little sparingly. By this course, the good old times of former days, which you speak of, will return again. We may not see them, but our children will, and we will live over again in them. I hope they may imitate the virtues and avoid the errors of their ancestors, and maintain the moral and literary standards which they practiced. He went to his son's plantations in a cheerful spirit and found them doing better with their farms than he had anticipated. Rooney had built a new house, which Lee praised as convenient, well-arranged and well-built. Robert was living in an old and dilapidated structure which his father did not visit at the time but described as scarcely habitable. The stay was all too brief, but as the general had laid out a schedule he was soon back in Lexington. While Lee was away, Colonel R. E. Withers wrote for the Lynchburg News a statement of the general's political views. It was not directly attributed to Lee, but it reflected certain of his opinions with measurable accuracy. It read as follows, General Lee deprecates the acerbity of political feeling now so rife in the land, and is disposed to believe that more moderation and prudence in the expression of opinion, and less bitterness in the denunciation of political opponents, would conduce more to the speedy settlement of the vexed questions which now agitate the country. 
He, however, studiously avoids political discussions and, with rare discretion, affords no room for cavil to the enemies of the South. Lee was in Richmond again on June 3 when Mr. Davis's case was due to be called and Chief Justice Chase was expected to be present. While the general was waiting in a room opposite that set aside for the judges, he was unexpectedly and somewhat unwillingly forced to hold an informal reception. H. H. Wells, a New Yorker who held the office of Governor of Virginia by military appointment, was in court as a spectator and came forward for an introduction. The general chatted with Wells for only a few minutes and then was interrupted by friends, most of them Richmond lawyers, who gathered about him to shake hands. Lee greeted all of them cordially but did not engage in much conversation. By agreement, when the Davis case was reached on the docket it was postponed to November 30th and General Lee and the other witnesses were recognized in the sum of $5,000 each for their appearance at that time. As Rooney was one of his fellow witnesses, the general had opportunity of seeing him while he was in the old capital, but once again he hastened back to Lexington, this time in order to be present during the examinations. He left Eastern Virginia somewhat unwillingly because he had wanted to spend a day at Shirley. It was the loved home of my mother, he wrote rather wistfully, and a spot where I have passed many happy days in early life, and one that probably I may never visit again. In gratifying contrast to the two calls to Richmond and coming between them was a mission to Lynchburg on May 20, 1868, to attend the annual council of the Protestant Episcopal Church of Virginia as a lay delegate from Grace Church, Lexington. Lee was present when the body met in St. Paul's Church, Lynchburg, and he doubtless heard the sermon of Rev. J. I. Latane of Staunton from the text, Sow to yourself in righteousness, reap according to kindness, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, till he come and rain righteousness upon you, a discourse intended to show the special need of the church at that time. Following the sermon, Bishop Johns made an appeal for the Diocesan Missionary Society and took up a collection. Then the Holy Communion was administered. At the afternoon session, which began at 2.20 o'clock, the general was again in his place. The next two days must have been busy, for Lee was named a member of three committees, that on the state of the church, that on church salaries, and that on a memorial to his old friend, Bishop William Meade. On the last day of the council meeting, the general was nominated a delegate to the General Convention of the Protestant Episcopal Church, the highest honor the council could pay one of its members, but he was not elected, doubtless because he did not feel he could attend. He made no speeches on the floor of the council, he was a constant but silent attendant, according to a newspaper report. The guest of John William Morrell, he received as much attention from the citizens of Lynchburg as his regular presence at the council meetings permitted. An odd incident happened while he was at Mr. Mull's. One night he was awakened by sounds as of someone gasping in pain. He waited a while, listening for some member of the family to come to the relief of the sufferer. Hearing no one, he got up, put on his clothes, and went to his host's door. He awoke Mr. Morrell with a tap and explained. Mr. Morrell made the rounds of the house but was unable to find anything amiss. The family concluded that the general had been dreaming of a battlefield. Perhaps General Lee decided that someone had been snoring. In all other respects, the session of the council passed without incident, and on the afternoon of May 22, the general took the packet boat up the James River and Kanawha Canal for home. Examinations crowded the days that followed Lee's June trip to Richmond, which occurred soon after the council meeting. Then came commencement. The college had a graduating class of 14, two in civil engineering, seven bachelors of law, five bachelors of arts, and it staged for them the most elaborate ceremonies that had been held since the war. The chapel was formally dedicated on June 14, much to General Lee's satisfaction, and the baccalaureate sermon was preached in the Presbyterian Church by the president's former Richmond rector, a courageous German refugee, Dr. Charles Minigerod. General Wade Hampton was another commencement guest, as orator before the literary societies, and he of course met his old commander. Lee was busy with the board of trustees, but he arranged his engagements so that he could entertain the South Carolinian at dinner, and with him he talked frankly of the war. It was one of the few occasions after 1865 on which he did so. Their exchange ranged far, back to the beginning of the struggle and to their decision to share the fortunes of the South. 
then it was that Lee made the simple observation that is the surest answer to all those who have contended that he hesitated before resigning from the United States Army in 1861, I did only what my duty demanded, he said. I could have taken no other course without dishonor. And if all were to be done over again, I should act in precisely the same manner. The conversation turned, ere long, to Early's last campaign in the Shenandoah Valley. When everything is known, said General Lee, I don't think General Early will be blamed as much as he has been. Presently Stuart's name was mentioned. Instantly the voice of Lee, which had been low, became clear and warm. General Stuart was my ideal of a soldier. He was always cheerful under all circumstances, always ready for any work and always reliable. He was able to stand any amount of fatigue and privation. When he stopped for a night's rest, he could throw himself on the ground, and, with his saddle or a log for a pillow, he would fall asleep almost immediately and sleep as if in a bed. Then, if sent an officer to him with an order, he was awake at the first call or touch. When his eyes opened his mind became fully awake. He did not have to yawn or stretch to get himself awake, but his mind and body seemed to awake at the same time and to become active and alert. Before any other officer that I ever had could get himself and his men awake, Stuart would be in the saddle, with his men in line, and be ready to move. The trustees were in session three days, June 1618, inclusive, and heard the usual reports, including that on the endowment campaign. Rev. E. P. Walton, who had conducted the canvass in New York, had been able to gather only $9,200 in large gifts during 1867-1868 as compared with $45,280 in 1865-1866 and $27,950 in 1866-1867. His total for the three years, including $5,278 of small gifts, had been approximately 88,848 dollars and 640 acres of land. Mr. Walton had opened a separate account for contributions to the building fund for GNLRE, Lee's residence as pressed of Washington College, but as he listed only six subscriptions, it is likely that Lee insisted this form of solicitation should be stopped. The same thing probably applies to Mr. Walton's proposed annual subscriptions to General R.E. Lee's salary, for only one pledge is listed under this heading. Undeterred by the small increase in endowment, the trustees outlined new plans for interesting friends of education in the college and authorized the expenditure of $600 for the employment of canvassers the following year. Numerous appropriations were made, including one of $500 for clerical assistance to General Lee to be expended as he pleased. A great volume of minor business was transacted. As the college still lacked funds for the establishment of a law school of its own, the arrangement with Judge Brockenborough was continued, though a new committee was named to devise a plan for the permanent connection of a law school with the college. The important decisions of the trustees had to with the course of study. The Department of English was taken from the School of Modern Languages and added to the School of History and English Literature. New courses in natural history and geology were authorized. The faculty was instructed to proceed with plans for enlarging the scientific department, a work that subsequently took on large importance. A survey board also was established. This was to consist of the president and the professors of mathematics, applied mathematics, natural philosophy, and chemistry. It was intended to prepare maps and to make geological surveys. Twenty-five new scholarships were approved, five of them to go to selected students already in college, and twenty to promising young men in academics and high schools selected by the faculty. Finally, in a commendable determination to raise the standards of the college, the trustees decided to change the requirements for the degree of Master of Arts. Up to this time that degree represented satisfactory graduation in nine schools, five of which had to be completed with distinguished attainments that justified the award of the Certificate of Distinguished Proficiency. It was now provided that after the session of 1868-1869, the Master of Arts would have to win this distinction in seven instead of five schools. In only two schools was he to be allowed merely to pass. The suggestions for all these improvements were made in the President's report and in faculty papers transmitted to the board by him. So ended the third session at Lexington under Lee's presidency. 
it had brought its vexations and its disappointments, and it had witnessed the only serious attack made on General Lee and the college during his administration. Although the endowment had not been increased largely, the year, financially, had not been very difficult, and scholastically it had been the best since the war. To Lee, along with some sorrows and sickness, it had brought new satisfactions. He made no move to resign as he had intimated the previous year he might do when the session of 18671868 closed. Instead, as his devoted associates saw, his love for the college increased with each year. He showed that feeling very positively when he received a call to accept the vice chancellorship and active administration of the University of the South. This invitation was based on a report that Lee was dissatisfied at Washington College and would be glad to make a change. Lee answered that he appreciated the honor the trustees of Sewanee had done him. They have, however, he wrote, been misinformed as to my feelings concerning my present position, and even if they were as represented, I could not now resign with propriety unless I saw it was for the benefit of the college. With a few more polite words, he declined the offer.